Domestic violence was not uncommon at all times, and victims frequently choose to silently tolerate this attitude toward themselves and the domestic tyrant, believing his impunity allows him to cross any boundaries. The worst thing about such situations is that children may become victims. The case of young T.L.A. Palmer made headlines across Australia a few years ago due to its extraordinary cruelty and monstrous coincidence of circumstances. When a child from one dysfunctional family moved to another, the situation became even more terrible and cruel. The girl's birth mother, in an effort to protect her only daughter from her tyrant husband, gave her to another family with the best intentions. However, as it turned out, she placed T.L.A. in the hands of death itself. The case in question is quite complex and ambiguous. There were several criminals, all from the same family. At the same time, the investigation determined that nearly all of them were victims of domestic tyranny. And now I'll tell you everything in order. T.L.A. Lissa, Rose Palmer, a girl from a dysfunctional family, was born in a small Australian town, Logan City, Queensland, in April 2003. Unfortunately, the girl grew up in less than ideal conditions. The family's head abused hot drinks, and the man was hot-tempered and aggressive. He repeatedly beat his wife in front of the child and, on occasion, the daughter herself. The girl was constantly stressed and lived in a state of fear and depression. It is not surprising that she began to flee from home on a regular basis in order to avoid hearing the endless scandals of her parents and coming under the hot hand of the father. We can only speculate as to why the girl's mother, Cynthia Palmer, did not leave the man who abused her and her daughter. However, the young woman decided to give her only child to another family, believing that this would be better. Cynthia later stated that it was a forced measure and that she was deeply sorry for it. However, she was unable to do so at the time because she was held hostage by the circumstances. However, the dysfunctional family's neighbors have a different story. According to some reports, Cynthia is an alcoholic. She attempted treatment, but overcoming addiction was not easy, and after another escape from home, when she was discovered wandering the streets on the other side of the city, the Palmer family became very interested in child protection services. Representatives from the service came to the family home and offered assistance, and Cynthia did not refuse to have her daughter temporarily placed in a foster home, given the environment in which the girl was raised. It's no surprise that she grew up to be a difficult teenager with a difficult personality. As a result, finding her a foster family proved difficult. She was always running away, loitering and begging on the streets. She disobeyed her guardians and did everything her own way. T.L.A. did not stay with her first two families for long because her foster parents simply couldn't handle her. She didn't commit any serious crimes, but she was frequently accused of lying. The girl desired the comfort of home, but had no idea what it should be and any disagreement with the household inevitably resulted in the child's escape from the Thorburn family in early 2015. Kylie appeared to have found her ideal foster family, who were eager to welcome her. Rick and Julia Thorburn, along with their spouses, made up the Thorburn family. We were raising two sons, Josh, who was 19 years old at the time, and Trent, who was barely 18. The family lived in a spacious two-story home with a swimming pool located in a small country town in Brisbane suburbs. They had their own horse farm, and Julen started a private kindergarten at home that was very popular, and local parents trusted the Thorburns with their children. The family was considered well, off and prosperous, respected in their home state, and trustworthy. Furthermore, they had demonstrated a willingness to accept a troubled teenager into their care, which was unusual. T.L.A. was placed in a new home in January after Child Protective Services determined that this was the best option for her. At first, everything went as usual. The girl rebelled, refused to live with her guardians, and ran away several times. But each time, the Child Welfare Service found her and returned her. But as the months passed, Kylie appeared to calm down, accept her new family, and get along with them. In reality, however, the outward well-being was hit by a real drama that quickly turned tragic, Ty Lai's mysterious disappearance. The girl attended a local school, which was a few kilometers from her guardian's home, so Kylie's foster father drove her to school every day, and after school, she made a lot of new friends who described her as a kind, cheerful, and happy girl. She continued to dream of returning home and maintained contact with her biological mother and grandmother. 
Tiali occasionally complained of discomfort and even fear without specifying what she was afraid of. On October 30, 2015, Rick drove to school as usual and then returned home to do chores. But he soon received a phone call informing him that his adopted daughter had not shown up for class. No one was particularly concerned because the girl had previously run away, but she usually returned in the evening or the next day. The guardians reported the incident to the police and the search for TLI began almost immediately. All members of the family willingly cooperated with the investigation and claimed that there had been no conflicts between them that could have resulted in a runaway for a long time. Instead, the girl was in good spirits and appeared to be quite happy. According to the family's head, he drove his daughter to school as usual, then returned home and cared for the horses until he received a call from a teacher reporting the girl's disappearance. His wife and sons confirmed these statements. The next day, the door burns set up a social media page dedicated to the search for TLA. They posted information about her photos, the time and circumstances of her disappearance, and a description of what she was wearing that day. The couple asked anyone with information about TLA's whereabouts to contact them or the police, but no one called. Police also searched the family's home in the state but discovered nothing suspicious. Although the foster parents' behavior appeared to be calm, they had essentially nothing to charge. Soon, many concerned people joined the search operation, genuinely concerned about the girl's fate they combed the area using flyers with her photos and interviewed local residents in the hopes of gathering some useful information, a discovery on the riverbank. After a week of unsuccessful searches, the fishermen contact the police and report a terrible find. According to the men, they went to the Pimpama River in the morning of November 5. However, after barely casting their fishing rods, they noticed something unusual in the swampy shallow water as they came closer. The fishermen were horrified when they realized their discovery was nothing but human remains. The police officers who responded to the call reported that the body was that of a short man, but it was so disfigured that it was impossible to determine the deceased's gender. He had no clothes on, and no personal belongings could be found nearby. The body had numerous injuries that were initially thought to be caused by wild animals in the area. Furthermore, it decomposed rapidly due to heat, moisture, and a large number of insects drawn to the distinctive odor. The gruesome discovery was sent for examination, and it was determined that it was a girl aged between 12 and 16 years old. The police then gathered information on all missing young people recently, and the corpse was quickly identified. It was Tyale Palmer, whom the entire city had been searching for for nearly a week. The cause of death was impossible to determine because the body had been in the water for so long. However, Experts speculated that Tyale died from asphyxiation after discovering that her hyoid bone had been crushed. The most horrifying aspect, however, was that the injuries, which were initially thought to be animal bites, could have been caused by a person prior to Tyale's death. Tyale's death was clearly criminal in nature, so a criminal case was opened and a murder investigation was initiated. However, the investigation was moving very slowly because no serious leads have been found yet. This meant that the process could take months, if not years, and result in another unsolved crime. The case quickly became public, and nearly a quarter of the city's population came to say goodbye to the deceased girl. People brought flowers, soft toys, and balloons to the memorial service. On November 14, young Tiali's body was cremated. Tiale's birth mother gave a series of interviews to reporters in which he openly accused Child Protective Services of criminal negligence that resulted in the tragic store fires. The Foster family willingly cooperated with the investigation from the start, but their behavior raised some concerns. Rick was supposedly the last person to see the girl alive, but no one could confirm that he actually drove his foster daughter to school on October 30. Spouse and sons claimed to have seen Tiale enter the car. Surveillance cameras along the school route also captured the car driving in that direction. However, no footage of Tiali leaving her guardian's car could be found anywhere. No teachers or classmates saw the girl that day, either at school or on the school grounds. Tiale appeared to have vanished. Investigators had growing doubts that Palmer was even in the car. Family members occasionally erred in their testimony about the events of that day but insisted that everything was as it had always been, and there was nothing to suggest trouble with the children's secrets. As part of the investigation, dozens of children and teenagers were interviewed, including the deceased's classmates and friends. 
Everyone spoke highly of her, but they did mention that Taya Lee of her, but they did mention that Taya Lai had recently been concerned about something but was unable or unwilling to discuss it. Tia Lei requested temporary shelter from a classmate a few days prior to the tragedy. She claimed she was in trouble and that the guardians would kill her. These statements were not taken seriously, and, despite feeling sorry for her, the friend was unable to invite someone to her house for a sleepover without parental permission. The other girl mentioned that Palmer had told her her secret. Trent, the youngest of the Thorburn brothers, was her 18-year-old love interest. Furthermore, she boasted that they were romantically involved and would be together in the future. The latter revelation sounded strange because Tia Lei was only 12 years old, and a relationship with an older brother, even an adopted one, seemed unlikely, like a childhood fantasy. Nonetheless, the information she received was definitely something she needed to look into. The Thorburn family members categorically denied all suspicions. They referred to their deceased adopted daughter as a liar who wanted to draw attention to herself, and they suggested that the girl's school friends may have made up something or fantasized. There was no solid evidence to suggest that the Guardians had committed a crime against Hailey, so they remained at large and went about their business as usual. Their private kindergarten continued to accept children, the farm thrived, and they did not have to deal with the pain of loss. For several months, the investigation was essentially on the same ground. Local residents with prior convictions were questioned, and those suspected of crimes were investigated. However, the search returned no results, and no new leads appeared. Even the announced high reward for any information about the case did not expedite the process. A parallel search was carried out in the area where TLA's body was discovered. And a month later, under a layer of silt, a backpack and a shoe presumably belonging to the deceased were discovered 150 meters away from where the body was. These items were obviously intended to be discarded so that they would never be discovered. The entire story drew a large public response. The search and investigation results were broadcast on television and published in the press, and city residents organized pickets to demand that the killer or killers be found and punished. The biological mother of the deceased Tia Lei organized some of the tickets. Eventually, the police appealed to potential accomplices of the perpetrator, promising them protection and immunity if they identified the perpetrator or provided any significant information. However, this appeal also went unanswered. In six months, no new clues or avenues of investigation have emerged, despite an anonymous call and a wiretap at the Thorburn residence. It wasn't until the summer of 2016 that police received an anonymous call that altered the course of the investigation. The anonymous caller claimed that the Thorburns were looking for a troubled teen for a reason. They were motivated by a mercantilist interest, as custody of troubled children is compensated with increased allowance. Anonymous also stated that their youngest son most likely had an intimate relationship with TLE, which he had mentioned in passing prior to the tragedy. Of course, this information could have been false. However, detectives remembered that they had previously heard from the deceased's high school friend that TLA and her name brother may have had an affair. The investigators decided not only to take a closer look at Trent, but also to examine him thoroughly. The interrogations yielded no results because the guy and his family members insisted on their nine involvement, claiming that the girl fled and then got into trouble. The family's social media pages were quietly examined, and one of the chat rooms in Trant's profile revealed an unusual correspondence. Approximately a month and a half before the tragedy, he told his cousin that he had an intimate relationship with a girl much younger than him, but he did not reveal her name. Of course, the dialogue on social media could not become incontrovertible evidence, but it did allow the police to obtain permission to install listening devices in the Torburn house, albeit without their knowledge. The wiretaps yielded shocking results within the first few days. On the recordings, family members could be heard meticulously rehearsing their versions of events, ensuring that their stories matched in every detail. The family had taught his household what to say and how to behave and from the mother's mouth came such phrases as dad made this decision to save, we'll have to live with it. Never, ever tell anyone or anything, regardless of what happens. Rick threatened his family members several times, and while it was clear that they were afraid of him because they knew his father could turn words into action at any time, there was still insufficient direct evidence. However, the Thorburn blue card, which granted them permission to work with children, was revoked almost immediately. 
forcing the private kindergarten to close. The wiretap quickly confirmed that the youngest of the brothers had been intimate with Tiale. In fact, it had been happening on a regular basis for several months before he informed his mother in October that Tiale was pregnant. If Trent's suspicions had been correct, he would have been sentenced to prison for having an affair with Tiale. Julia told her husband everything, and Rick decided to take action. Julia and her sons arrived in Brisbane early on the day of the tragedy, ostensibly for business. It was supposed to serve as an alibi for them, so Rick stayed at home with his adopted daughter. When the mother and heirs returned home in the evening, it was already known that the girl had gone missing, and the family's head claimed to have solved the problem without providing any details, including arrest and investigation. Based on the information obtained, all members of the family decided to re-interview, and the police decided to search Rick's car, in which he allegedly drove his adopted daughter to school on the day she vanished. And it turned out that the car was sold almost immediately following the tragedy. The vehicle was located, and a thorough inspection revealed old washed out traces of blood in the trunk. DNA analysis revealed that the blood belonged to Tialai, who had been murdered. After that, any remaining doubts were dispelled and the Thor Burns were taken into custody. They were questioned separately, with Trent being the first to speak. It turned out that he had duped Tiale into seducing him by telling her about his feelings and promising that they would always be together. She fell completely in love with him, believed him, and even boasted to her school friends that she was in a real relationship. However, when she became suspicious of the pregnancy, she realized that the foster father could literally kill her and began to ask her classmates to take her in, at least for a while. Rick fought the longest, but was put under pressure by evidence and testimony from his family members. He confessed to killing his foster daughter, claiming he was only trying to protect his family. He had strangled her severely and disfigured her body in the hopes that no one would ever identify him. Rick didn't consider the possibility of DNA testing when the head of the family was formally charged with first-degree murder. He collapsed and was rushed to the hospital with a heart attack. Their doctors concluded that he had caused the attack himself by taking a large dose of powerful drugs. They fought for his life for several days so that the perpetrator could face trial and receive a just punishment. The entire country followed each family member's trial and sentencing, as well as the investigation and trial. Because the Tiale Palmer case became one of the most publicized and cruel in the last decade, each member of the Thorburn family was found guilty but many believe their sentences were too lenient. For example, Josh, the eldest son, was sentenced to just three months in prison for perjury and attempting to obstruct the investigation. The court considered his genuine remorse and the fact that he was a key witness against his father and younger brother during the trial. Julia Thorburn was sentenced to one and a half years in prison for perjury and harboring her husband and son. At trial, she admitted that she was terrified of her husband and believed he could murder her and her son. The youngest of the brothers was sentenced to four years in prison, which many children believe is too light a punishment for seducing Tai Lai. Perjury and obstruction of the investigation. In fact, the young man served just over a year before being released early. The head of the family who treated Tai Lai the most brutally was sentenced to life in prison. He pleaded guilty to all counts and expressed deep regret for his actions. Rick repeatedly stated that he was motivated by the desire to protect his family, but he does not understand how he could commit such a crime. Following the final verdict, Tiali's birth mother gave an interview in which she stated that none of the punishments for her daughter's killers were harsh enough. However, the day of the verdict signals the end of her quest for justice. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The tragic story of Lacey Peterson, a young school teacher, not only shocked the public with its unimaginable cruelty and inhumanity, but it also set the stage for the passage of the Lacey and Connor Act. Connor was the name of her unborn son, who died alongside his mother, and the law was intended to protect children from violence before birth and punish those who endanger their lives and health. The case is far from unique but the fact that a pregnant woman was abused by someone close to her who was supposed to protect and care for her is shocking and puzzling. Several television documentaries have been produced about the case. Despite circumstantial and controversial evidence, no one questioned the defendant's guilt. And he, in all of his appearances, 
demonstrated that he is not sorry or repentant for what he did. This is one of those stories that gives you chills all over. But let's try to figure out how the guy who was considered a model family man decided to commit such an atrocity. Who was Lacey Peterson? Lacey Denise Peterson, maiden name Rosha, was born in May 1975 in Modesto, a small town in the central part of California. Dennis Rosha and Sharon Anderson had known each other since high school, and their teenage romance resulted in marriage and the birth of two children, Brandon, the eldest, and Lacey, the daughter. Curiously, the mother named her daughter after a local beauty queen that she admired. The family owned their own farm, so the children learned to work in the fields and care for animals from a young age. The girl was extremely close to her mother. They worked together to create a beautiful garden filled with flowers and fruit trees. Then Lacey considered connecting her future life to this occupation and pursuing a specialized profession. When the kids were still small, the family faced a crisis and no matter how hard the spouse tried, they were unable to save the marriage and soon divorced. By mutual agreement, the children continued to live with their mother in their hometown. Two years later, Sharon remarried. Her chosen one was a childhood friend named Ron Grant Ski. Ron treated his wife's children as his own and in fact replaced their birth father, who was uninterested in the heir's lives following the divorce. The girl even started calling daddy. A few years later, the couple had a daughter named Emily Lacey, who grew up to be a kind, sociable, and open girl. She always had a large group of friends. She always had a large group of friends. She did well in school and was a member of the cheerleading team. After graduating from high school, the dark-haired beauty passed her exams and was accepted into the prestigious California State University. She decided to pursue her childhood dream of becoming a landscape designer. Lacey has always been a creative person who enjoys drawing, so she found her chosen profession, which is Scott Peterson. Scott Lee Peterson is also a California native, but he was born on October 24, 1972, in the large metropolis of San Diego, in the southwest of the state, to Jacqueline Helen Latham and Arthur Lee Peterson. The boy grew up in a fairly well-to-do family, and from a young age, he knew nothing to refuse. His father owned a business that produced packaging materials, and his mother ran a designer clothing store. By the way, her boutique was located in Hollywood, among the regular customers were several celebrities. Scott's difficult personality began to emerge in childhood. He enjoyed being the center of attention, did not tolerate bans or refusals, and was described as a spoiled, capricious, and even arrogant child in school. The boy began playing golf at a young age and considered pursuing a professional career in the sport. He was friends with Philip Mickelson, also known as Lefty, the future professional golfer who was ranked second in the world in 2012. As a teenager, Scott was one of San Diego's best athletes. Following graduation, the young man enrolled in one of Arizona's universities, where a promising athlete paid for half of his education. However, Peterson was unable to receive a diploma because he was expelled for inappropriate behavior following a raucous potluck, already consuming strong alcohol in the presence of other students. After months of deliberation and searching for a suitable location, the young man applied to the University of California, where he initially intended to study economics but later changed his mind and transferred to the Faculty of Agriculture. By the way, Scott took the educational process very seriously and responsibly this time, becoming an exemplary student because his parents threatened to leave him without a job if he was expelled again. Scott and Lacey, a love story. Young people met while studying at university. Scott began working part-time in one of the local coffee shops, where he also worked as a waitress alongside a former classmate and close friend of Lacey. Lacey frequently stopped by to eat and see her friend, and when she noticed the handsome young man, Scott noticed the smiling petite brunette and began to give her his full attention. One day, Lacey went to the coffee shop but didn't see her friend. She decided to ask Scott what was wrong. They quickly started talking. However, because Scott had to work, Lacey wrote her phone number on a napkin so they could contact each other later. Scott called her back that evening, and Lacey was thrilled. After speaking with him, he informed her mother that she had contacted her future husband. A few days later, he asked his new acquaintance out on a first date, and Lacey readily agreed. It's worth noting that Peterson had another passion besides golf, fishing, so he invited Lacey to go deep sea fishing in an open body of water.
She accepted the offer, but she became seasick on the boat, forcing the couple to quickly return to shore and family life. Nonetheless, after that not so great first date, the couple began to meet, and a few years later, they decided to move in together. Scott had finally abandoned his dreams of a professional sports career and decided to start his own small business. In the summer of 1997, he used the startup capital to help his parents. After Lacey received her diploma, the couple held a traditional wedding with a white dress veil and vows at the altar. They only invited family and close friends to the celebration. And as a venue, they chose the popular Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort, which is located on the ocean in Western California. Following their wedding, the couple moved to San Luis Obispo, a small resort town between Los Angeles and San Francisco. They decided to open their own sports bar, but the idea was doomed from the beginning. There were rumors that Scott's parents once again assisted with the execution of the business plan. However, they later denied it, claiming that their son was a poor businessman who they discovered while he was still attending university. Anyway, the couple's business was not very successful. They initially had constant problems, first with the institution itself, then with the management, but they eventually managed to spin the number of visitors up over time, and by 2000, when the Petersons decided to sell the institution, it was already a well-known and popular destination. The couple decided to settle in Lacey, their hometown, and start a family. They bought a small cozy house in a good neighborhood, a car, and a dog. And about a year later, the young woman told her husband the happy news that they would soon be parents. Lacey had already decided to change her career path and accepted a position as an art teacher at a local school. Her husband was having difficulty finding work and was forced to accept a position with a fertilizer and organic fertilizer company. Lacey tried to be the perfect wife in order to bring comfort and peace into her and her husband's new home. She kept everything in perfect order, loved cooking, entertaining guests, and had a lovely flower garden on the lawn. Scott appeared to be supportive of his wife in all aspects, and from the outside they appeared to be the perfect couple. He accepted the news of the upcoming addition to the family with joy. When the couple discovered they would have a boy, they actively began to choose a name for him. The future parents chose the name Connor for their son, and everyone was sure that they were looking forward to the child's birth as a pregnant teacher. Lacey, who was eight months pregnant at the time, mysteriously disappeared on December 24, 2002. Lacey's mother and stepfather, who had been unable to contact her throughout the day, raised the first alarms. She did not answer the phone or return calls, which was unusual for her. As it turned out, the husband had been unaware of his wife's whereabouts the day before. She had visited her parents as well as the beauty salon where her sister Amelia worked. She was cheerful as she prepared for the Christmas and New Year's Eve celebrations. Lacey allegedly went for a morning walk with her dog, but a few hours later, neighbors discovered the Peterson's dog wandering down the street, dragging a dirty leash behind him. At the time, no one suspected anything wrong. The neighbor, he said, simply thought the dog had escaped, so we took him to the owner's backyard. For the evening, the concerned parents called the police and reported him missing requesting that they begin searching immediately because Lacey was pregnant, and if she was in trouble, she required assistance as soon as possible. However, she was never found that day or the next. A day later, word of the missing teacher spread throughout town, prompting hundreds of volunteers to join the search. People combed the area, pasting flyers with portraits of the girl and organizing search pages in social networks where they posted detailed information about the missing mother and stepfather. The older brother and younger sister appealed to all concerned on television, requesting assistance in the search and sharing any useful information for which a reward was even announced, except that Scott behaved strangely and even suspiciously, refusing to participate in press conferences, showing little interest in the search results and appearing unconcerned. Mr. Peterson's behavior, according to the investigator in charge of the case, raised suspicions from the start. He was frighteningly calm, and the police officer's questions annoyed him. He asked no questions, acted arrogantly, and, most interestingly, confused his statements by changing them multiple times. Scott was the last person to see his spouse on the day she went missing. He went to the golf course in the morning to get some exercise and play while his wife stayed at home, intending to walk the dog and do some cleaning later. When he got home, he found the dog in the backyard, 
but Lacey was nowhere to be found. Scott did not go to the police because he believed his wife was visiting her parents. However, when she still did not show up, he became concerned and called his mother-in-law's house, where he was informed that Lacey had not arrived. And that's when the first inconsistencies in Scott's testimony became apparent. First, no one could confirm his alibi because he hadn't been seen on the golf course. Second, the father-in-law claimed, as confirmed by the taped conversations, that he had called Scott himself while looking for his stepdaughter. But he replied that he had no idea where she could be. Peterson then abruptly changed tactics, stating that he had changed his mind about playing golf and instead planned to go fishing at a secluded location in Berkeley Harbor. He explained the confusion over the phone calls by stating that all of the relatives were on edge and couldn't remember who had called whom or when during the inspection of the couple's home. A strange and frightening detail was discovered. Lacey's purse, which contained her house keys, phone, and some cash had gone missing. She wouldn't have left the house without at least taking her dog for a walk to the nearby park. How would she lock the front door? This nuance was alarming, raising suspicions that Lacey had not vanished on the street, but rather from her own home. A grisly discovery. On April 13, nearly four months after the pregnant teacher went missing, local fishermen noticed something strange on the rocky shores of San Francisco Bay and decided to investigate further. As it turned out, their attention was drawn to the body of an infant that had washed up on shore. The boy's body had hardly decomposed, but it was severely disfigured, apparently as a result of the body being battered by the waves against the rocks for quite some time. His umbilical cord appeared to have been torn rather than cut. A day later, in a different part of the bay, a few kilometers from where the infant was discovered, a severely decomposed body of a young woman was discovered. The corpse was so disfigured that it wasn't immediately identifiable as human remains. But the most gruesome aspect was that the body was missing its head and most of its limbs. There were only a few fragments of clothing left on the body, including a special maternity bra. It was simply impossible to identify the body, so only DNA testing could determine that it belonged to the missing teacher. According to criminalists, the baby was well-preserved because he was in the womb the entire time, but the body rejected the fetus during the decomposition process. According to eyewitnesses who discovered the boy, something strange resembling a ribbon or rope was wrapped around his neck and he had a large cut on his body. Although the autopsy results were never officially released, the experts claimed that the cut was caused by a wave hitting the body against a sharp rock and that the noose around his neck was simply trash. Scott evaded capture during the investigation and search. Furthermore, Lacey's parents actively defended their son-in-law for the first few days, describing him as an ideal husband and their marriage as happy and built on love and trust. But the more the police learned about this man, the more suspicious he appeared to them. Peterson began cheating on his wife almost immediately after the wedding, even before the couple moved to Modesto. Later, he had numerous mistresses with whom he lied about not being married or recently widowed. Thus, in the fall of 2002, Scott went on a blind date with a lovely blonde named Amber Frey. The girl worked as a Seuss and raised her young daughter alone. She was looking for a life partner who would love and accept her and her child, and Scott was handsome and polite. She knew the feelings were mutual. Scott almost immediately admitted that he had recently been widowed, and that the upcoming Christmas would be the first without his beloved deceased wife. Amber consoled him as best she could, and from that point forward, they communicated almost daily. Scott soon told his mistress that they could move in together after the holidays, and the couple began to plan their future together. True, Scott stated that he has never wanted to have his own children and plans to undergo a sterilization procedure known as a vasectomy, but he was also prepared to raise daughter Amber as his own. Everything was fine until Amber happened to see a TV report about the disappearance of a pregnant local teacher. Despite the fact that the missing woman's husband did not give an interview or appear in front of the cameras, the broadcast featured photos of her and Lacey together and Amber recognized her lover. Another intriguing feature was Scott's drastic change in appearance following his wife's disappearance, which included growing a beard and bleaching his naturally dark hair on his head and face. Amber couldn't believe what she was seeing and hoped it was all a dream. However, she soon realized that she was dating the same guy. She went straight to the police and told them everything, even agreeing to record their phone conversations. Amber wondered why Scott had told her he was a widower, 
a couple of weeks before his wife vanished, but he must have sensed something was wrong. Despite his evasiveness, as soon as the bodies of the deceased mother and child were found, the question of immediately arresting Scott as the main suspect arose. Despite the fact that the investigation lacked hard evidence, there was a good chance Scott would try to leave the country. In fact, that was exactly what he planned to do. But, fortunately, he did not have time. On April 18th, 2003, the widower was taken into custody, but he refused to admit his guilt. Simultaneously, his house, garage, and car were thoroughly searched, yielding frightening results. Microparticles of Lacey's dried blood were discovered on tools in the garage, the trunk of the car, and the bottom of the fishing boat. Experts discovered several hairs from the deceased woman. The clothes Scott was wearing on that fateful day had long since been discarded. The house had undergone several general cleanings with the assistance of cleaning services, and the building itself had already been listed for sale. But the most difficult aspect of the investigation was the inability to determine the exact date of Lacey's death, which made it impossible to verify the suspect's alibi. Traces of cement were discovered in the garage, trunk, and Peterson's boat, further complicating the investigation. The material was thought to be the foundation for a homemade anchor, with which he intended to dispose of the body so that it would never be discovered. However, there was no direct evidence against Scott. He was found guilty of two counts of first and second degree murder. Despite the lawyer's vigorous and confident defense, almost no one doubted Scott's guilt. His actions were the most obvious indication of this. He was neither excited nor upset. He took no part in the search. He was in a hurry to get rid of the evidence, selling his wife's house and car almost immediately after her disappearance, changing his image, and leaving the country with his mistress. Investigator Jonathan Bueller, who had been working on the case since Lacey's disappearance, stated in court that he had no doubts about Peterson's guilt from the beginning. He realized this after his initial conversation with him. The court first imposed the death penalty as a punishment. However, after an impressive number of appeals, the sentence was changed in 2021 to life in prison with no chance of parole. In addition, the court redirected the deceased's mother to receive a quarter of a million dollars in life insurance for Lacey, which was originally assigned to Scott. This high-profile case horrified the public and highlighted the importance of protecting unborn children from violence as they may become victims of similar crimes. Thus, in the spring of 2004, the Lacey and Connor Act was signed in the presence of the deceased woman's parents and sister. Three years after the tragedy, Sharon Rocha wrote a biographical book called In Memory of Lacey, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss and Justice, in honor of her daughter and grandson. All proceeds from the sale of the publication were donated to charity. The book was one of the top bestsellers in American nonfiction. Lacey, Sharon's husband and stepfather, died of a heart attack in the spring of 2018, just before another court hearing. He was buried next to his beloved stepdaughter and grandson. By the way, Lacey's father died in December of the same year. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Beautiful, wealthy, famous, and successful women can be deeply unhappy in their personal lives. The Turkish arabesque performer Belgian Cyril Miser, also known as Bergen, was tortured by her husband for many years. She is a well-known figure in Turkey and around the world. He beat her, disfigured her face with acid, and eventually shot her. Our heroine today is Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros, an Ecuadorian performer, television actress, music producer, and lingerie designer also known as Sharon La Hechiquera, or simply Sharon, through her own hard work, perseverance, and talent. She has risen to heights beyond imagination, becoming one of Ecuador's and Latin America's top stars. Karen wished for simple female happiness, family comfort, and a peaceful harbor to which she could return every evening and simply be herself. But the man she loved, her husband and the father of her child, saw in her only an endless source of funds for his trouble, free and carefree existence. This man was ultimately responsible for the death of the nation's favorite in 2015. However, despite widespread publicity, the final point in this high-profile case has yet to be resolved. Sharon lacks a biography from her early years. The future star was born on March 28, 1974, 
in Santiago de Guayaquil, a large metropolis. Located on the Gaias River in Ecuador's province, the girl's full name was given at birth. Sounds like Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros. She grew up in a simple, modest family with two other children. Soon after her daughter's birth, the entire family relocated to Duran, where the future queen of techno, Cumbia, spent her childhood and youth. Edith was a bright, active, and artistic girl from a young age. At home, she was affectionately known as Charo or Cherito, and this nickname later became part of her stage name. Edith grew up watching the popular American comedy television show B with another name, My Wife Bewitched Me. Her idol and object of imitation was the show's main star, cult actress Elizabeth Montgomery. Then the same girl changed her name to Charo, Enchantress, and aspired to replicate her favorite actress's success. She has always been interested in music and enjoys singing. She had a good musical ear and decent vocal data, but calling them outstanding was difficult. Nonetheless, the girl won over everyone with her natural charm, artistry, and ability to reincarnate. At the age of eight, she won the City Children's Festival by performing Foxing Taiko compositions in Los Angeles. By the time she graduated from high school, she had won numerous awards in local and regional music competitions. She aspired to be a famous singer and perform on stage, but her parents were skeptical. They believed that the heiress lacked the talent to become a star and that because their family had no connections in the entertainment industry, a career as a performer was not worth pursuing. Edith, following the advice of her family, decided to attend university, pursuing a more practical and down-to-earth career as a public relations specialist at the State University of Guayaquil's Faculty of Communication Sciences. Her dream of becoming a singer, however, remained unfulfilled. He believes that everything has a time and that she should wait a little before pursuing the most appropriate path to fame. While attending university, Edith worked as an assistant teacher and kindergarten teacher, a seller of sweets and maroca, a traditional Ecuadorian drink, and a dancer in the local creative team, performing as a warm-up act for visiting popular artists and musical groups. But all of this was just to save money, which he later used to record her debut music album, Braveheart, which was released in 1998. In 2005, the singer released her third studio album and received the prestigious award for being the first solo techno cumbia artist in the country to top the music charts. In 2010, she released her fourth album, Poco a Poco. Two years later, her fifth album was released, which unfortunately became the last in her life and career from the early 2000s until her untimely death in 2015. Sharon was the author host and co-host of numerous entertainment programs and TV shows broadcast on TV channels in Ecuador and other Latin American countries. She has appeared in several television series and has worked as a public relations specialist for Canela TV. In addition to a successful career in music and television, he has decided to try her hand as a fashion designer, creating seductive lingerie from her own sketches. And in this case, she waited for success and the brand she created quickly gained popularity among women across America. Sharon was not interested in doing whatever business. She was successful in every way, reaching new heights and receiving recognition. Personal life of the performer. Despite her dizzying success on stage, television, and in the fashion industry, one of Ecuador's most prominent stars had a less than idyllic personal life. She disliked discussing this topic with the press and avoided answering such questions from journalists at all costs. However, Sharon Law Haxera was constantly in the crosshairs of numerous photo and video cameras, making hiding anything from prying eyes impossible. It is known that in the mid-1990s, the aspiring performer was romantically involved with Eduardo Gray, an entrepreneur and music producer. The couple had been officially engaged for several years, but the wedding did not take place. Although Edith gave birth to a daughter from her lover, whom she named Samantha, the daughter inherited her mother's entrepreneurial spirit and artistry, becoming a well-known performer and actress. Despite her best efforts and connections, she was unable to surpass her mother. Sharon began a new romance shortly after her breakup with Eduardo. This time, her chosen one was a little-known television operator, whom she met while working on a telenovelia. Their relationship grew quickly, and after a brief engagement, the couple held a modest wedding, attempting to conceal the event from others. However, the information quickly became public. 
and the marriage itself lasted only a short time. The performer preferred to remain silent on the reasons for his sudden divorce. Later on, the artist had romantic relationships with a well-known impresario named Pedro Francisco, a young ballet dancer who performed with her on stage and some of her star colleagues. Unfortunately, none of these romances progressed to a serious level, and Sharon ended her relationship with her boyfriend for various reasons. The performer declined to comment on the events in her personal life. She raised a career, oriented daughter, but still hopes to find a worthy, loving man in her life. Relationship with Giovanni Lopez In 2009, the performer met Giovanni Lopez, a young man who was more than 10 years her junior. He was born in Ecuador but moved to the United States with his parents when he was a young child. The family settled in New York City, where Giovanni spent most of her childhood and adolescence. They first met during the singer's large tour in the United States. But at the time, their communication was limited to work, and Lopez assisted in the organization of Sharon's performance. Even so, these two have most likely developed some sympathy for one another. Furthermore, it turned out that the young man was a longtime fan of the Queen of Technocumbia, and he was thrilled to have the opportunity to work with her directly. A year later, Giovanni decided to return to his native Ecuador. He brought with him designs he had created for artists, including one for Sharon specifically. So began their collaboration, and almost immediately a stormy romance developed between them. At the start of this relationship, the performer was already 36 years old, while Giovanni was only 24. However, the 12-year age difference did not embarrass them, and the couple was unconcerned about what others would think of them or how the media would write about them. Almost immediately, the lovers moved in and decided to live together. However, it should be noted that the performer's parents and daughter treated her new chosen one with caution, and Giovanni immediately disliked it and they concluded that the young man's twisted romance with the star was solely for selfish reasons, and that he did not love her at all, but only wanted to use her. Sharon ignored the warnings of loved ones because he believed he had met the most important man in his life, with whom he would share many happy years. Soon after the couple married, they began to consider the birth of a common heir. However, they encountered a problem because the performer was unable to become pregnant. As a result, she decided to use in vitro fertilization, and in May 2012, the 38-year-old celebrity gave birth to a boy named Brian Giovanni Lopez. The abusive relationship Giovanni, they only tried to be a caring and loving man on whom you could rely on everything. However, as soon as the couple married and the performer became pregnant, the young husband's behavior began to change dramatically, and he literally transformed into a domestic tyrant. He no longer sought to earn money independently, and he was content with his position as an Alphonse. He willingly spent his wife's money on his own needs, entertainment, expensive clothes, and personal grooming. Lopez also began to abuse alcohol, and appeared less and less frequently at home, preferring to spend time with friends and mistresses. To all of this, Giovanni began to openly insult his wife, pointing to her age and fading beauty. According to some reports, as a result of his offensive statements and remarks, Sharon decided to undergo a number of plastic surgeries in order to maintain her youth and resemble her husband. In particular, the performer enlarged her breasts and performed a number of cosmetic manipulations. However, all of her efforts were in vain and did not contribute to the restoration of family peace and harmony. The Queen of Technocumbia continued to work actively, starring in TV series, hosting entertainment shows, and preparing material for a new album. She tried to smile in public, claiming that she was finally content in her personal life. However, only people close to her knew about how things were really going in her family. In early 2014, when little Brian was not yet two years old, the artist made the first serious attempt to end the relationship with Giovanni, but he said that he would agree to give a divorce only if Sharon would give him half of his property and funds in her bank accounts so that he could continue to lead an idle and carefree lifestyle to which he was used. Sharon could not agree to these terms, so she began consulting with lawyers about how to end the marriage while keeping the property and full custody of their joint young son. By the end of the year, family life had become unbearable, but the couple continued to appear happy in public. One final family trip. On the eve of the new year 2015, the performer gave a number of festive concerts and she also starred alongside her star colleagues in several dedicated Christmas and New Year's events. After that, exhausted by her work, 
the young woman decided to take a small vacation to the warm coast with her friends, husband and son to relax a little and try to gather her thoughts before deciding what she should do next. On the evening of January 3, 2015, the entire company decided to return because the journey was going to be long and they were driving. The friends decided to follow each other and stay in constant contact in case anyone needed assistance. They decided to pre-plan all of their stops along the way. Sharon had to drive the car at evening because her husband had consumed alcoholic beverages throughout the day. After a few hours, the company stopped at a gas station and decided to eat dinner in a roadside cafe. During the meal, the singer and her young husband got into a heated argument because Giovanni ordered another drink. Despite his earlier promise not to drink and drive, he allowed Sharon to rest and spend time with the child. The couple argued for about 30 minutes and couldn't agree on who would drive the car. Finally, their friends couldn't take it and asked if they could go on their way. The singer stated that she did not want to delay them due to family issues, so they could continue and he and Giovanni would need to stay a little longer. The friends reluctantly agreed and after another half hour, drove away, leaving the couple at a roadside cafe. They had no idea Sharon would die before they saw her again. Strange accident. On January 4, around half past 2 a.m., the friends received a phone call from an agitated Giovanni who asked them to return because there had been an accident and Sharon might have died. His words were shocking because he did not provide specifics, making it impossible to determine what had occurred on the night road. By the time they returned, emergency services were already on the scene, attempting to assist the victim and reconstruct the sequence of events. According to Giovanni, at around 1, 15 a.m., on the highway to Del Spondilis, near the Ecuadorian province of Santa Elena, his wife got out of the car to comfort her crying son and change his diaper. At that point, another car smashed into her at high speed. Without stopping, this car sped away from the accident scene. The young woman was thrown a few dozen meters to the side of the road by the impact. When the ambulance arrives, she was still alive. She's been taken to the hospital. Despite the doctor's best efforts, Sharon died of massive injuries and internal bleeding. Giovanni was still drunk and confused during his testimony and his testimony, and his story sounded strange and illogical. As a result, the police decided to detain him until the morning so that they could question him thoroughly. When he had come to his senses, Lopez confirmed the words of friends that he and his wife argued all evening and admitted that, despite his wife's promises and prohibitions, he defiantly drank alcohol in order not to drive and piss off Sharon Giovanni's testimony. He did not see the license plate number of the car that hit his wife, wife. He didn't remember the mate and only mentioned that the car was white. There were no CTV cameras along that stretch of road. No witnesses could be found and the accident itself appeared suspicious because Sharon did not even turn to the side of the road before leaving the cabin and did not ensure her safety. Although any vehicle on a straight, deserted road can be seen and heard from afar even at night, the longer the police tried to correlate all of the facts with Lopez's story, the more it resembled a premeditated murder. Giovanni was confused about the timing and chronology of events and could not recall details. Most interestingly, he couldn't explain why their car was facing the opposite direction of the road they were on. Following another interrogation, the deceased singer's husband was arrested as the primary suspect in her death, the autopsy results, and Sharon's funeral. The autopsy revealed that the deceased woman's body had numerous injuries consistent with a traffic accident. However, experts discovered a clear and fairly deep mark on Sharon's chest that could have been caused by a seatbelt. This fact raised additional questions and suspicions. Samantha, who spent the New Year's holidays with her boyfriend, was stunned when she learned about the tragedy from singer Sonia Ramos, a close friend and colleague of her mother. She called her father, Eduardo Gray, and asked him to come to her as soon as possible so that they could go to Sharon's house together and start planning the funeral. After making all the necessary preparations, the celebrity's body was transported to the Colosseum Voltaire Paladins Polo in the province of Guayaquil. Thousands of Ecuadorian friends, colleagues, and fans gathered to say goodbye to one of the brightest stars. Furthermore, this sad event was covered in all of the country's leading publications, and it was even announced on television one morning. Samantha, overcome with grief, sobbed on her father's shoulder, surrounded by her grandmother, grandfather, uncle, and aunt. 
The deceased celebrity's family refused to comment on what had occurred. None of them directly accused Giovanni of what happened, but they all demonstrated their disapproval of him through an investigation and a surprising court decision. The case was among the most high profile in Ecuador's history. It received extensive media coverage and jeopardized the reputation of the country's judicial system. The initial verdict literally shocked the celebrity's relatives and fans, and the case's revision was so delayed that the final point in this matter has yet to be resolved. So the white car, which presumably hit the artist, was discovered a few days later. The car had characteristic damage, which experts have determined could have resulted from an accident. If you hit someone at high speed, the owner of the vehicle is a young woman named Tatiana Chavez, who has categorically denied any involvement in the accident. However, the prosecutor's office has opened criminal cases against Tatiana for negligent homicide and Giovanni Lopez for premeditated murder. His story sounded extremely unconvincing. He was confused and contradicted himself before recognizing the car and even claiming to have seen the driver, only to doubt his own words by referring to alcohol intoxication. In parallel, the deceased's daughter and parents issued a statement blaming the singer's husband for the incident. They believe he never loved Sharon and committed the murder to seize her money and custody of the child. Samantha stated that her mother had discussed the dissolution of their marriage with lawyers shortly before the tragedy. Samantha also stated that her younger brother, who was the only witness to the incident, cries all the time and repeats, Daddy is bad. However, they did not involve the child as a witness in order to spare the boy further psychological trauma. After a detailed reconstruction of the events of that evening, Tatiana was ruled out as a suspect. By comparing the times and locations where Tatiana had been seen before and after the accident, it was determined that she could not have been physically near the accident site at that time, and her car had been damaged in another accident. The other car was soon identified as the one that struck Sharon. Louis Carrillo, the owner and driver that night, was arrested. By that point, he had already replaced the broken headlight and repaired other body damage. However, experts were able to determine that at the scene of the accident, shards of glass from his car were discovered. Lewis admitted to everything and stated that Sharon literally fell under the wheels of his car, and he was so scared of what had happened that he simply drove away. Giovanni was convicted of manslaughter against his wife in June 2015. Experts determined that the woman's chest injury from the seatbelt was caused by her attempting to protect herself before her husband pushed her out of the car, directly under the wheels of another vehicle. However, Sharon's relatives and fans were taken aback by the court decision. Because her killer was only sentenced to three years in prison, he is seeking a retrial and appealing the new verdict. Such a lenient sentence sparked a media frenzy and prompted widespread protests across the country. People demanded just punishment for the murder of a celebrity and national favorite. Already in July of that year, the judges involved in the case were suspended and later dismissed. The new judicial staff overturned the previous verdict, citing a number of administrative and bureaucratic errors. All defense lawyers' attempts to challenge the reversal of the verdict were unsuccessful. Louis Carrillo was cleared of any responsibility for the singer's death, but he was charged with fleeing the scene and attempting to conceal evidence. But Giovanni Lopez was brought to every court session under heavy security to avoid attacks on him by Sharon fans. In October 2015, the singer's husband was found guilty of her death and sentenced to 26 years in prison. The court also considered Samantha's evidence of Giovanni's cruel treatment of her mother, as well as the fact that he blackmailed his wife by demanding a large sum of money in exchange for her consent to divorce. A few months later, two appeals were filed simultaneously. The prosecution demanded that the sentence be increased to the maximum of 35 years, while the lawyers argued that the new sentence was legal. However, both complaints were dismissed. In 2021, Lopez attempted to appeal the court's decision. In addition, he claimed that he was mistreated in prison and that his rights were violated severely. The prisoner even went on hunger strike to persuade the court to release him. He claimed that he was wrongfully convicted while the primary perpetrator of the tragedy, Luis Guerrero, remained free. Giovanni appealed again in 2023, this time with a new lawyer, in the hopes of securing his release. It is worth noting that in this difficult case, the judge's composition was changed once more due to the revealed abuse of power. As a result, Lopez's defense team hopes to not only challenge the verdict, but also seek compensation for the years he spent in prison. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
the Vaughn family case. What happened on a deserted road on June 14, 2007? Kimberly Vaughn, 34, and her three children, 12-year-old Abigail, 11-year-old Sandra, and 8-year-old Blake, were found dead on a highway near Bluff, wrote Blake, were found dead on a highway near Bluff Road. They all died as a result of close-range gunshot wounds. Christopher Vaughn, the family's head, was the only survivor and suffered only minor injuries. He claimed he was shot by his wife, who he believes killed their children to settle the score. Christopher, on the other hand, was unable to provide specific information because he allegedly had a memory lapse. The case was investigated for five years before a final verdict was reached. However, some people continue to question the justice of the verdict. The story has remained a hot topic on popular television talk shows, prompting numerous questions. We'll try to get to the bottom of things from the start. Kimberly Phillips and Christopher Vaughn have been together for over a decade, have three children, and appear to be a happy and friendly family on the outside. Kimberly Vaughn, real name Phillips, was born in the small town of St. Charles, Missouri in December 1972. She grew up in a relatively affluent family with two daughters, Jennifer and Elizabeth. By the way, Jennifer was our heroine's twin sister. The Phillips did not take shortcuts when it came to their daughter's education and development. Kimberly, like her sisters, attended a prestigious school and participated in sports. She had many friends who described the girl as outgoing and friendly. Christopher Vaughn was born in September 1974 in St. Louis, Missouri, a nearby city. He was one of three sons in a modest yet welcoming family. During his school years, the young man was very interested in soccer and also enjoyed hiking, camping, and family vacations out of town. The couple met in the early 1990s. They quickly developed a romantic relationship. Kimberly's parents opposed the union from the beginning because the chosen daughter was a few years younger than her and did not yet have a stable job. Furthermore, as previously stated, I grew up in a modest, if not impoverished, household. However, the young people were so in love with one another that they refused to listen to anyone else. Kimberly soon became pregnant, and the couple got married in the summer of 1994. The groom was not yet 20 years old when the wedding took place, and the bride was only a few years older. They both seemed to be well prepared for family life, however. Their daughter Abigail was born four months after the wedding, in October of that year. Just a year later, the couple welcomed their second daughter, Cassandra. Three years later, their youngest son, Blake, was born. The spouse's early years of family life were peaceful and happy. Young people fell in love, made big plans for the future, raised their families, and organized their homes. All of their children were gifted, grew well, participated in a variety of sports, loved music, and performed in the school drama theater. Kimberly, a homemaker, was constantly raising her voice. She oversaw her school's PT. The young woman also led the scouting group, which included all of her children. In the meantime, the family patriarch founded and expanded his own small cybersecurity company. A few years after their wedding, the family moved to Washington State, and in early 2000, they settled in a small town in Illinois, where they could afford to buy their own large home. Kimberly then decided to pursue a law degree and enrolled in one of the local universities. She received her diploma just a month before the tragedy. At first glance, this family appears to be happy and strong. However, few people were aware that the couple's relationship deteriorated soon after the relocation. Christopher frequently traveled to another state for work, and he developed an affair with a woman named Jill. This relationship lasted approximately a year, and Kimberly eventually became aware of it. A serious scandal erupted within the family. The husband and wife had separated and were getting divorced. However, after weighing all of the pros and cons, the couple decided to stay married for the sake of their children. Husband and wife did their best to pretend that everything was fine, but the tension between them gradually grew. Kim lost trust in her chosen one because she was jealous of him and suspected him of cheating, which proved to be reasonable. On the nervous ground, the young woman began to have health problems. She suffered from anxiety, migraines, insomnia, and blood pressure problems. Kimberly was forced to seek medical attention and was given several medications to treat her condition. She took them for a year and also saw a psychologist with whom she discussed her family's issues. Despite this, Kimberly remained social, friendly, and energetic. 
Others described her husband as a withdrawn introvert who rarely showed emotion during a fateful trip in June 2007. On the eve of their 13th wedding anniversary, the couple planned a family trip to an amusement park in Springfield, Illinois. Christopher selected the location, and the rest of the family supported his decision. So, in the early hours of June 14, after settling into their SUV, the entire family set out. A few hours later, a passing vehicle picked up the Vaughn family's bloodied head as it drove down the highway. Christopher was wounded in the leg. He calmly reported that he had been shot by his wife, but he couldn't go any further because he allegedly had a sudden memory loss. The victim stated that he and his family were driving to an amusement park when his wife became car sick and asked him to pull over. He pulled over to the side of the road and exited the passenger seat to inspect the roof rack. Then he heard a gunshot. Following that, everything unfolded like a horror film. Christopher realized his wife had fired, saw blood running down his leg and fled, unconscious and unaware of the children in the cabin, only to be picked up by a random car. Christopher was unable to locate his SUV, but police discovered it almost immediately. They found four bodies in the car with gunshot wounds, except for Kimberly, who was killed with a single shot to the head. Everyone had been shot twice previously. Christopher admitted that he had a gun at home, which was probably loaded and carried by his wife. Christopher believes she murdered their children, shot him, and then took her own life. While telling this, he did not show much emotion, and even when the police showed him pictures of the deceased family members' bodies during the station interrogation, Bond remained remarkably calm, which could only raise suspicions. Kimberly's parents learned of their daughter and grandchildren's deaths from an impolite reporter who called them at home to inquire about their son-in-law and whether he had harmed their loved ones. During the initial interrogation, everyone insisted that Christopher could not have killed his own family and that the crime was most likely committed by someone else on the road. However, the police officers who witnessed the crime scene had a different perspective from the beginning. They stated that the crime was entirely domestic in nature, with only family members suspected of involvement. Initially, no specific suspect names were given. In subsequent interrogations, the family's surviving head could not recall any new information, but he was confident that his wife could have done it all, killing the children, wounding him, and then shooting herself. Christopher blamed the pills she'd been taking for a year, as well as the crisis in their relationship caused by his infidelity, which they couldn't overcome. Vaughn dismissed the loss of memory caused by being shot, and for the same reason, he did not immediately contact the police or emergency services, instead rushing away, oblivious to the pain in his injured leg. His words sounded unconvincing, but they were insufficient to get Christopher arrested. The family's home was searched, and a couple of laptop computers were taken for inspection. While the preliminary investigation was underway, Christopher remained at large, busy planning his wife's and children's funerals. The funeral was scheduled for June 23 and would take place at one of the city's funeral homes. A large crowd gathered to pay their final respects, and nearly everyone noticed the conflict between the Vaughn and Phillips families. Soon, a police car approached the building. Christopher was arrested shortly before the funeral service began, accused of murdering his family. He remained calm and walked silently with the police. However, his parents were furious about what was going on. They expressed disappointment that their son was not even allowed to say goodbye to his wife and children. While his guilt had yet to be proven, this difficult case had already received widespread media attention. Members of the Vaughn family speculated that Christopher's arrest at the funeral was intended to draw even more public attention. At the same time, the Phillips family was pleased with the results. In an interview, Kimberly's mother expressed relief that her daughter had been cleared of a crime against her children. The investigation questioned Christopher's words from the start, but he stubbornly blamed everything on a lapse in memory, claiming that he couldn't reconstruct the timeline but he was certain his wife had committed this heinous crime. He was simply fortunate that the bullet struck only the thigh's soft tissues, avoiding the larger vessels. During the investigation, it was discovered that Christopher had his wife's insurance policy, which included a $1 million payout in the event of her death. As the investigation into this case progressed, the police became more convinced that the husband was the primary perpetrator of this terrible tragedy. The investigation lasted more than five years, and Christopher was held in custody throughout. Despite his continued efforts to prove his innocence, Vaughn was charged with several serious offenses, and if convicted, he faced death. As a result, under state law, 
he was entitled to attorneys paid for by a special fund established to protect people facing the death penalty. Christopher's defense attorneys were thorough in their efforts to shift blame for what happened to his late wife. They discovered that Kimberly had a number of mental disorders that she developed during the marital crisis caused by her husband's infidelity and the resulting health problems. And the drug she was taking allegedly worsened her condition rather than improving it. Lawyers nearly succeeded in proving that the wife took a loaded gun from home on a family vacation, massacred the children, injured her husband, and then shot herself in the head. The evidence and materials presented appeared to support this version, so the case was left to be decided. However, the state is currently implementing reforms to abolish the death penalty, and as a result, Chris has lost his lawyers whose work had been funded by the foundation. They requested a quarter million dollars to complete the case, but Vaughn didn't have much money. Christopher was assigned a public defender who had to handle the case from the start and devise a new line of defense. This time, the attempts to exonerate the defendant seemed far less credible. The defendant's personal laptop, which was seized during a home search, contained an unusual and lengthy correspondence with a Canadian resident named Steve Wyland. The two had met on a social networking site about 10 months prior to the tragedy and began corresponding almost daily. Christopher told his new friend that he was deeply unhappy and that his marriage and family life were dragging him down. The men talked about the advantages of living in the wilderness, away from civilization, like hiking, camping, and survival skills in the forest, deserts, and mountains. Vaughn eventually persuaded his new friend to help him fake his own death in order to flee his family. Steve, on the other hand, was opposed to the idea and declined to participate. Chris then stated that he would still abandon his family and city life to flee to a Canadian province where no one could find him. About a month before the tragedy, the accused started writing about a girl named Maya who he planned to take with him and allegedly loved. The police were able to easily find and bring Maya in as a witness. She turned out to be a dancer at Christopher's favorite strip club, and the two dated for several months. Throughout this time, Christopher complained about his unhappy family life. He once offered to run away with her. But Maya saw this plan as a foolish adventure, so she refused. Vaughn also had an affair with another young dancer to whom he falsely claimed to be single and child-free. I want to impress the girl. He spent a lot of money on her in a short amount of time, and even offered to take her to another country with him. The two girls and their pen pal were called as witnesses at the trial. Their testimony revealed that the defendant intended to flee with one of his mistresses, rather than preserving his marriage. Christopher Vaughn's trial began in the fall of 2012, and it received extensive media coverage. Evidence revealed that he had purchased a gun shortly before the tragedy and had gone to shooting ranges several times to practice using it. Notably, the last time he fired at targets was the evening before his family's trip. Experts also discovered that the shot in Christopher's thigh was fired almost at point-blank range, contradicting his claim that his wife shot him when he got out of the car while Kimberly remained inside. Furthermore, the bullet holes in Christopher's jacket prompted numerous questions. According to the prosecutors, such a trace could have been caused by a single bullet fired while he was wearing his jacket. However, this assumption could not be validated. One of the most significant pieces of evidence was Kimberly's bloodstains on her husband's clothing. If Christopher, as he claimed, left the car while his family was still alive, how did his wife's blood, which he claimed she shot herself after he ran for help, get on his clothes and shoes? Furthermore, Kimberly's blood was not found on the murder weapon or on her hands, which would be impossible if she had shot herself in the head with a gun to her chin. However, a drop of her husband's blood was found on her thumb. In addition, Christopher's work computer was used to perform several searches for detailed staging of the crime scene. Kimberly's doctor also testified at the trial, claiming that the young woman suffered from insomnia, headaches, and high blood pressure, for which she was given a variety of medications but that she had no negative thoughts or intentions to harm herself or others. The defendant was found guilty of all counts associated with such a heinous crime. Christopher received four life sentences, one for each family member, with no chance of ever being released. Shortly after receiving such a harsh sentence, Vaughn unexpectedly stated that he remembered everything from that day in great detail and had not forgotten anything. According to him, shots rang out after he exited the vehicle but he had no idea what was going on. 
He then noticed the children's bodies, and then his wife shot him in the leg. She shouted that it was all his fault before shooting him in the head. The convict's new testimony had no bearing on the verdict because it sounded so ridiculous. However, Christopher's parents have actively sought to defend their son in front of the public. For several years, they have appeared on various talk shows, given interviews, and written blogs and social media posts about their dissatisfaction with life and how marriage has altered it. They also consistently blame all of the problems on the Phillips family, claiming that their members refused to accept their son-in-law from the start and did everything they could to make his life miserable. The Bond family had filed several clemency petitions, hoping that Chris would be acquitted or his sentence commuted. Several such petitions were delivered to the governor of the state. However, after reviewing the case file, he stated that he had no reason to question the court's decision. He advocated for the murder of a whole family. Furthermore, he committed the most heinous crime imaginable, leaving no room for leniency or justification in this case. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Today, we will examine a case that unfolded in Minnesota in 2013. Kira Steger, a 30-year-old store clerk at a clothing store in the Mall of America, was known for her dedication to her job. She had never missed a shift. So when she didn't show up for work on February 23, 2013, her co-workers grew concerned. They attempted to reach Kira, but received no response to calls or text messages. Consequently, they alerted the police that she was missing. Kira K. Steger was born on November 19, 1982, in Des Plaines, Illinois. She was the daughter of Marcy and Jay Steger, who lovingly described her as a lively, dedicated, and sweet daughter. Kira had been employed at the Mall of America, working at two stores, Wet Seal, and more recently, Delia's. Her co-workers were not just colleagues, she considered them family. Kira had a unique ability to recognize people's strengths, even when they didn't notice them themselves. She had ambitious plans and dreams for a bright and serene future. Tragically, all those dreams vanished in an instant when Kira mysteriously disappeared on Thursday, February 21st, 2013. On that day, she had a shift at work and her coworkers reported that she seemed in good spirits, planning to enjoy a nice dinner with her husband after her shift. Kira and Jeffrey Trevino had met three years prior and had ignited a spark, leading to a romantic relationship and ultimately a wedding. Overall, they appeared to be a happy and stable married couple. Although they had occasional disagreements, these seemed minor and were kept within their private circle. Neither their relatives, friends, nor co-workers were aware of any serious issues. However, two days after Kira failed to come to work, on Saturday, February 23rd, her co-workers grew increasingly concerned as her behavior was atypical for her. She was known for her punctuality and strict adherence to her schedule. Unable to reach Kyra, her co-workers contacted Jeffrey, who had no knowledge of her whereabouts. Jeffrey explained that Kyra had left their home the previous morning and hadn't returned. He didn't find it particularly concerning since Kira had a history of occasionally disappearing for a day or two, staying at a friend's or relative's place unannounced. One possible cause for concern was the heavy snowfall that day, which could have resulted in difficulties on the road, such as her car getting stuck or her phone battery dying. Receiving no news from his wife, Jeffrey filed a missing persons report and contacted Kira's family. This mysterious disappearance shocked Kira's loved ones profoundly. Detectives immediately started working on Kira Steger's missing persons case upon receiving the report. Typically, investigations in such cases begin by questioning the spouse and searching the immediate vicinity. This case was no exception, and detectives visited Jeffrey's residence to speak with him. Jeffrey told the detectives that on Thursday, he and Kira had spent time together after work, having dinner, playing bowling, and eventually leaving the mall. According to Jeffrey, they went straight home as Kira intended to watch a movie. Jeffrey also mentioned that his wife left their house the next morning, a Friday, around 8.30 a.m., as she had a work event that required her presence. He didn't find her absence unusual, given her history of occasional disappearances. 
Jeffrey, however, did admit to some relationship problems over the past few months. He considered these disagreements to be minor, typical of any family. When the detectives asked if Kira might have had a lover or been staying with someone else, Jeffrey denied this possibility. He claimed to trust his wife and love her deeply. The investigators gathered information about Kyra and her car, and they personally visited the Mall of America to verify Jeffrey's account. The mall, one of the largest in the world, is located in Bloomington, boasting 520 stores, theme parks, an oceanarium, movie theaters, a golf course, and more. Given its size, it had numerous security cameras. After reviewing the surveillance footage, detectives confirmed that Jeffrey's account held true. They observed that he met Kira after work, and they spent time together at the mall before heading to the parking lot and leaving. There were no signs of any arguments, and the evening seemed ordinary. However, the anxiety of not knowing Kira's whereabouts weighed heavily on her loved ones as each day passed without any news. Unable to bear the uncertainty, Kira's family traveled to Bloomington to assist with the investigation. They distributed flyers with her pictures in an effort to raise awareness and garner public help. While Kyra's family distributed flyers, investigators continued their efforts. During interviews with neighbors, officers noticed a surveillance camera at one neighbor's house, which partially captured the area around Kira and Jeffrey's home. They asked the homeowner to provide them with the camera footage in hopes of finding clues. Meanwhile, cell phone records provided a new lead. Kira had another man in her life besides Jeffrey. Ryan Went, who managed one of the stores she worked at. They had a significant and ongoing romantic relationship, as evidenced by frequent correspondence. Ryan was out of state at the time of Kira's disappearance, traveling towards Colorado. This raised questions for investigators. Was it a mere coincidence, or was there more to Ryan's sudden move? They had to find the answer, but they eventually cleared him of suspicion as the timing of their text messages indicated, he was not involved in her disappearance. Examining the video footage from the neighbor's surveillance camera became crucial for investigators. The camera's rapid rotation made it challenging to observe anything carefully. Still, they managed to capture a few seconds of Kyra and Jeffrey's house. Jeffrey's account of their evening appeared to align with the footage. However, upon closer examination, they noticed Kira's car reversing into their yard shortly after 2 a.m., although the poor quality of the footage and the camera's constant motion made it hard to discern details. Nonetheless, the car soon left the property. Jeffrey explained that he drove to a gas station because Kira had asked him to fill up her car before her morning commute. Surveillance footage confirmed his trip to the gas station around 3.30 a.m. Surprisingly, after leaving the gas station, Jeffrey didn't return home but instead headed towards the highway. The neighbor's camera didn't capture his return, but this could have been due to the camera's constant rotation. Investigators considered the possibility that Jeffrey might have returned home later when the camera was facing another direction. Further analysis of the footage showed Kira's Chevrolet leaving at 9.21 a.m., but it was impossible to determine the driver. A missing persons report had been filed on Saturday, February 23rd, on Monday, February 25th, the police received a call about a suspicious vehicle near the shopping center where Kira worked. Security guards at the multi-story parking lots had noticed a car parked there for several days and called a tow truck. Upon closer inspection, the tow truck driver found red smudges on the trunk lid and reported it to the police. It turned out to be Kira's white Chevy, containing a few small bloodstains. Inside her purse, they discovered divorce court forms that appeared to have been downloaded from the internet. Additionally, a rolled up trunk mat found in the snow behind the car was stained with Kira's blood, confirmed through DNA testing. This grim discovery suggested that Kira was likely no longer alive. It devastated her family and friends as her last hope of seeing her again had faded. Many questions remained unanswered. How had she died? Had she suffered? And who could have harbored such resentment as to take her life? The absence of Kyra's body made the situation even more difficult to bear for her loved ones. The detective's top priority became identifying the person who abandoned the vehicle in the parking lot. 
The car left the house at 9.21 a.m., and the mall's cameras captured it shortly after. Although there were no cameras in the parking lot where the car was found, one camera pointed towards the path leading to the car. This camera captured the arrival of the car, followed by the appearance of a hooded man. Given the cold weather, the hooded attire wasn't unusual. The man crossed the street, had a brief conversation with a taxi driver at a nearby stand, and then got into the cab. The police identified the taxi company based on the timing of the interaction and the license plate number. All the taxis in the parking lot were equipped with GPS tracking devices, allowing the police to determine that the hooded man's journey ended near Kira and Jeffrey's house. He paid cash and left the neighborhood, passing by the same camera that partially recorded the couple's home. Two minutes later, another hooded man entered the frame. Although the footage had low resolution, they noticed a white logo on his hoodie. As they continued watching, the hooded man entered the house where Kira and Jeffrey lived. Kira was still missing at this point, making it highly likely that the hooded man was Jeffrey. With a search warrant secured, law enforcement officers headed to the house. At first glance, it appeared to be an ordinary home. But upon closer inspection, forensic experts discovered dark red stains in the bedroom. Stains were found on the wall next to the bed, and approximately a hundred on the mattress. Luminol revealed more hidden bloodstains on the carpet that extended from the bedroom into other areas of the house. Forensic analysis confirmed that it was Kira's blood, strengthening the investigator's belief that she was no longer alive. The police also examined Jeffrey's car but found no blood or signs of a struggle. However, they did discover something interesting, a gas station receipt in Jeffrey's car, issued an hour and 40 minutes before Kira's car was discovered in the mall's parking lot. The receipt showed that Jeffrey had used his card to make a purchase at the gas station, followed by a cash withdrawal from an ATM. To gather more evidence, detectives reviewed the gas station's security footage, which showed Jeffrey filling his car with gas, going inside the station, and withdrawing cash from the ATM. The footage briefly revealed his face, as well as a logo on his jacket that resembled the logo on the man seen in the earlier surveillance footage. Based on this new information and the evidence found in the house, Jeffrey Trevino, 39 years old, was arrested. He was taken to the police station for questioning and became the prime and only suspect in the case. During questioning, Jeffrey immediately invoked his right to remain silent, seeking advice from his attorney. The police had enough evidence to charge him, but locating Kira's body was crucial to further cementing his guilt. Everyone believed Kira was no longer alive. As the police, Kira's family, and volunteers conducted extensive searches, they made a disturbing discovery in late March. Near Keller Lake, a few miles from Trevino's house, volunteers found a peculiar bag by the roadside and contacted the police. Inside the bag were a bloodied pillow, a shirt, and a bra, all linked to Kira through DNA analysis. Although divers searched the lake, they found no remains in the water. The area around the lake was also scoured multiple times using search dogs specifically trained to find bodies, yet their efforts yielded no results. After two and a half months on May 8, 2013, the St. Paul Police Department received a troubling call. A caller reported seeing what appeared to be a dead body in the Mississippi River. Police retrieved the body, and dental records confirmed it was Kyra Steger. Kira had suffered severe blunt force trauma to her forehead and a fractured index finger on her left hand. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, the exact cause of death could not be determined. With this new evidence, investigators sought to reconstruct the timeline of events leading to Kira's death and its aftermath. It was speculated that upon returning home and discovering Kira's romantic correspondence with someone else, Jeffrey grew increasingly angry. When Kira refused to show him the messages, he forcibly took her phone, resulting in a broken finger. As his rage intensified, he tragically took Kira's life and attempted to hide the evidence. Using Kira's car, he transported her body to the house, then later used the car to dispose of her remains in the river. He made a stop at a gas station and withdrew cash, knowing he would need to pay for a taxi after abandoning Kira's car at the mall. Returning home, 
Jeffrey attempted to create the impression that Kira had left on her own that morning and was fine. However, surveillance cameras foiled his plan. In October 2013, a jury convicted 39-year-old Jeffrey Trevino. His defense argued that the act was not premeditated and resulted from a heated and sudden argument sparked by the discovery of his wife's infidelity. Before sentencing, Kira's family members made statements in court. Her sister, Carrie Ann Steger, referred to Jeffrey as a calculated criminal and expressed that he deserved no mercy. Marcy, Kira's mother, pointed out that Jeffrey had shown her daughter no mercy and had discarded her like trash in a polluted river. Jay, Kira's father, emphasized that no punishment could ever compensate for the pain Jeffrey had caused their family. In November 2013, Jeffrey Trevino was sentenced to 27 and a half years in prison. He became eligible for parole in 2031. On December 20, 2017, a press conference was held during which Mark Perez, special agent in charge of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, announced a breakthrough in the disappearance of Mike Williams, a Tallahassee real estate appraiser who was originally presumed to have drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole. An alligator ate him on December 16, 2000. The truth is that Mike Williams did not drown in the lake. I can tell you that because I am here now. Perez said. Animals that eat people did not eat him. He didn't leave his wife and 18-month-old daughter behind when he left town. He was killed. We can't say more about it yet because the investigation is still going on, but I'm happy to say that. This morning, investigators told the Williams family about new information they had found in the case. Today's story is about love, betrayal, cheating, and greed, but it's also about a mother who has been strong for 17 years and four days. Mike's mom, Cheryl Williams, didn't believe that her son had drowned in Lake Seminole. She pushed hard for police to look into her son's disappearance, and she really thought that the people who did it would be punished, even when no one else did. Either he was alive or he was dead. I chose to believe he was alive, and I think that's what helped me," Cheryl said on December 20, 2017. A lot of people told me I was crazy, but we would never have found him if I gave up. Brian Winchester was given a 20-year prison sentence the day before the press conference. He was a close friend of Mike and his wife Denise, and later married Brian. In a strange way, those who did what happened got what they deserved when the truth came out in 2000. Mike's mother was right. In 1997, Brian and Denise started having an affair, which turned into a murder. After a few years, they went from being lovers to strangers who didn't trust each other. Brian was afraid that Denise would tell the police about what happened to Mike after the divorce, so he beat her up. On the other hand, Denise did everything she could to get him a life sentence. When she asked the jury for the harshest sentence, she was very convincing. Because of this, Brian felt he had nothing to lose, so he made a deal with the prosecutor. In 2017, Brian got 20 years in prison for kidnapping Denise Williams. He avoided getting a life sentence, though. Denise was happy about the win and didn't know that Brian Winchester, 49, actually agreed to plan the murder and a 17-year cover-up of it in exchange for not being charged with any crimes related to his part in the case. In exchange, he showed police where Mike's body was and told them the whole truth. In just a few months, on May 8, 2018, Denise Williams would be caught and charged. Things look a little fuzzy at first glance, don't they? Let's look at this case in more depth. She was born on October 16, 1969, in Bradfordville, which is north of Tallahassee. His father drove a bus and his mother taught kindergarten. He was known as Mike by family and friends. His family didn't have much money, and he and his older brother lived in a trailer as kids. Those were good times. Because the parents cared about their son's future, they didn't build a house. Instead, they saved money for both boys' college education and worked part-time in supermarkets at night. The sons signed up to go to North Florida Christian High School. Mike did great. He played soccer, led the student council, and was active in the key club. Mike began duck hunting as a hobby when he was 15 years old, and that's how he met Denise Merrill. 
It was a girl who played soccer and was president of the student council. As a cheerleader and council secretary, Denise met him and started dating. Their friends thought they were a great match while they were still in high school. Denise put Mike in touch with Brian Winchester, who became his best friend. Katie Thomas became Brian's friend after a while, and the two couples stayed friends for the rest of Mike's life. Following high school, Mike went to Florida State University and majored in both political science and urban planning. The lovers graduated at the same time. Denise went to school to become a public accountant, and Mike learned how to value real estate. Mike did a good job at work. His job went well, even though he worked 15 hours a day most of the time. The young well-off man married Denise in 1994. Around this time, Brian also got married to Kathy. They all stayed in close contact with each other. Mike was very energetic and loved his wife very much. He worked hard to provide for their family as best he could. Mike Williams had a lot of success as a real estate appraiser when he was 31 years old. He was making almost $200,000 a year. In 1999, they had a happy child and were able to afford a house in a small, nice neighborhood on the east side of town. The name they gave their daughter was Ansley. His friends told me that he was always smart. The young man was doing some pretty dangerous things, so he wanted to make sure that his family would be taken care of if something went wrong. It was no surprise that Mike went to his best friend, who worked as an insurance agent at the time. Brian sold him two insurance policies, the first for $250,000 and the second for $500,000. Mike's dad died in the year 2000. Williams was shocked by how quickly this happened that he turned to a friend again to get money for his family. For $1 million, Brian helped Mike make sure he would live. Denise says that the loving father of the family had almost $2 million in life insurance about six months before he went missing. They were married on December 16, 2000. Her husband got up early to go duck hunting on Lake Seminole, a big lake that is connected to the Apalachicola River. Today was their sixth wedding anniversary and they had planned to spend the night in Apalachicola, a small town on the bayou. Mike's wife and daughter were waiting for him at home at noon, but he never came back. Of course, Denise was worried, so she called her dad, who then called Brian Winchester, Mike's best friend. Brian drove to Lake Seminole with his dad. They found Mike's Ford Bronco car near the boat dock, but Mike wasn't there. There was no boat to be found, so the men called the police. They looked in all the places Mike liked to hunt. Police from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission were called to help look for Mike. After a few hours, a helicopter pilot saw the boat drifting away from the boat ramp about 225 feet. The boat was searched, and Mike's shotgun was found still in its case. It looks like he never got to use it. The search turned into a mission to save lives. People in the area thought that the reservoir used to be an orchard before the three rivers were dammed up to make the lake. The lake was named Stumpfield because there were so many stumps left. The water level had stumps that stuck out above and below it. Because of this, any motorized boat in the area had to be handled carefully. People looking for Williams thought he hit a stump on his boat, fell out, and went under the water. His wading boots filled with water and he probably drowned when he couldn't get out. A dive team from Montgomery, Alabama, and the Jackson County Sheriff's Office were among the other groups called in to help, but the thorough search turned up nothing. Mike was never found. After a week, the search for bodies turned into a rescue operation. Dogs were brought to the site, and probe poles were given to the teams to use to look into the lake's bottom. Ten days into the search, people found a hunting hat with a camouflage pattern that could not be linked to Williams. Fish and Wildlife Conservation officials in Florida thought that Mikey's body had been eaten by alligators, which is why it couldn't be found. Most of the alligators that lived in the lake were male. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement agreed with this theory because they didn't see any signs of a violent death. The search was over after five weeks. Denise held a memorial service for Mike the day after the search was over. This was less than two months after the alleged accident. Everyone thought Denise was okay with losing her husband, but Mike's mom wasn't. In June 2001, six months later, an angler found wading boots floating in the lake. 
Divers searched the area around the lake and found a light hunting jacket and flashlight at the bottom. Williams had signed and written on a hunting license that was in one of the jacket pockets. The find made a lot of people wonder. There were no teeth marks on the hunting jacket or the boots that would have been made by an alligator. The things that were found didn't look like they had been in the water for six months. The flashlight still worked and the boots weren't slimy. But after a week, Denise's lawyer asked the court to declare Mike Williams dead based on the things that had been found. He said that alligators and other animals that live in water had eaten the body whole and the motion was granted. The death certificate said Mike drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole on December 16, 2000, which was an accident. The body hasn't been found yet. For Mike Williams, this is how things might have turned out if Cheryl Williams hadn't given up and kept looking for her son. All I know is that I can't stop looking for him until I find him, she stated. Cheryl's efforts made things very difficult between her and her ex-sister-in-law. Denise told her to stop looking and face the truth. She told them, I'm sick of reading about Mike's disappearance. I just want to move on with my life. If you keep pushing this investigation, you will never see your granddaughter again. Denise kept her word, and Cheryl couldn't give up on her son. If the mother hadn't been so determined, her son's story might still be at the bottom of a dark, algae-covered lake. Three years passed before Cheryl Williams could get the police to start looking into what happened to her young son. Cheryl will tell you years later, I called, put up signs, wrote to the governor of Florida every day, put together my notes into an evidence book, asked people to post on social media, and talked to reporters about my missing son. The mother was so determined that she finally called alligator expert Matthew Oresco. In his answer, he said that alligators don't eat in the winter because it's too cold. The water temperature drops when it's cold, so alligators don't eat in the winter. They only keep their bodies at the right temperature. Alligators don't care about food at all when it's 14 deg outside. Oresco also wrote that forensic evidence is always left behind after an alligator kills an animal. After three years, Cheryl Williams finally got the police to drop the crazy alligator theory and start a real investigation into her son's disappearance. Investigators decided that Williams' death was not an accident after learning some little-known facts about what alligators eat, talking to people, and looking at some official records. All the police agencies working on this case agree with my gut that Mike did not drown in Lake Seminole, said Ronnie Austin, who used to work as an investigator for the 2nd District State's Attorney's Office and prosecuted Mike's case. At first, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency took over the case because Williams was thought to be a hunter who had gone missing. Police spent 735 hours looking for the body in a 10-acre area of the lake, but they didn't look for any signs of wrongdoing. The Jackson County Sheriff's deputies who were brought in to help with the search also didn't look at any other options. Investigators talked to everyone who helped with the search. Years later, police officer David Arnett, who was at the scene that day, said that some things seemed odd right away. Williams didn't usually hunt alone. His truck was found in an undeveloped area from which he would have had to drag the boat over mud, not on the nearby concrete boat launch. He usually used. The terrible storm that night should have pushed the boat to the east shore, but it was found on the west shore. The boat's motor wasn't running, but it was full of gasoline. If Mike had been driving the boat and fell out of it, it would have continued to float in circles until it ran out of gas. Sadly, law enforcement started to doubt too late that they were dealing with a straightforward drowning. A lot of volunteers and searchers had already walked all over the crime scene. A car that could have been a clue was taken by the family without any checks being made. Possible witnesses were not found. When police learned that Winchester had divorced his wife Kathy and married Denise, they became suspicious of both Denise Williams and Brian Winchester. They also found out that Denise got an unexpected windfall of almost $2 million from the life insurance policy of her late husband. Investigators found that Winchester was the one who sold Mike the policy. They also thought it was odd that Denise, Mike's wife, didn't want to be involved in the investigation and tried to stop Cheryl from doing anything, even telling the grandmother she couldn't talk to her granddaughter. They were called in for questioning in 2005 but it didn't add anything new to the investigation. 
Brian made up an excuse for what happened the morning of the disappearance of Mike Williams. Based on what his ex-wife Kathy said, he was 60 miles from the lake and in bed at home. He told her that he had planned to go hunting with his dad in the morning, but had slept in instead. Even questioning Denise didn't turn up any new clues. In 2008, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement said they didn't think Mike's disappearance was an accident and that they thought he had been robbed. Unfortunately, they can't bring charges because there isn't enough evidence. We have suspicions, but we need proof, Cheryl Williams said after another investigation failed to find out what happened to her son. She did not give up, though. Because of her work, the Discovery Cable Channel did a story on Mike's disappearance and the investigations that followed. By late 2011, Cheryl had lost faith in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and thought it was either not capable of solving the case or not interested in doing so. Since 2012, Mike's mother has sent Governor Rick Scott about one letter a day, asking him to either give the investigation to another agency or name a special prosecutor to do it. Over the course of nine years, Cheryl wrote 2,600 letters to the governor. Brain and Denise broke up after Denise caught him cheating on her in 2012. After a few more years, Denise asked for a divorce. An evaluation of the old family home was to happen. After that, not even property issues would hold them back. This event changed the course of Mike's case. Brian and Denise didn't want to get a divorce, but they also didn't want to stay together. They fought all the time, and the Williams investigation made fun of them. Brian called Denise, but she stopped calling him back. He was too stressed to handle it. Denise left her house on August 5, 2016, to drive to work at Florida State University. That day, a real estate appraisal was due because of a court order. She saw someone get into the back seat of her car while she was on the phone with her sister. Winchester was the one it was. Denise was told to keep going straight ahead by Brian, who put a loaded gun to her ribs. He said he had to do it because she wasn't home when he called. Denise tried to make Brian feel better, agreed with everything he said, and said she would give him a chance to save their marriage. Brian thought so. He got out of the car after Denise told him she wouldn't call the police to report what he had done. The brown sheet of plastic, the bleach sprayer, and the tools were with him when he left. As time went on, it became clear that Denise had miraculously lived. Denise called the fire department. Brian was quickly arrested and charged with kidnapping, which in Florida is a first-degree felony with a maximum sentence of life in prison. Besides that, he was charged with assault and armed burglary. The judge decided that Brian should stay in jail without bail. Cheryl Williams said she was hopeful that this new information would help solve the mystery of where her son went. Brian will not leave Denise with all the cash by herself. I pray that he will tell us what really happened, she told the New York Daily News. Brian did tell, and he was able to get a very good deal from the prosecutor that kept him from getting a life sentence at first. Brian started his story by saying, I think we were all doing really well, but I wasn't a good husband. I found a note in my first wife Kathy's purse one day and knew she was cheating on me. I was after revenge. Denise and Mike and I often went to bars and concerts together. Denise and I had been friends since high school. I've never really liked her, but after Kathy cheated on me, I changed how I felt about other women. Brian and Denise started seeing each other in October 1997. What started as drunk sex at a rock concert quickly turned into regular secret meetings. We started getting together at hotels during the workday and did so whenever we could. Brian said he didn't want to get a divorce. Denise made it loud and clear that she would never leave her husband. She cared about what other people thought and she didn't want to share custody of her daughter. Over time, the relationship grew into more than just meeting up for sex. Denise and Brian sent each other gifts and love letters because they saw themselves as a couple. It was clear that things could not keep going this way. They couldn't live without each other, and Denise didn't want them to get a divorce. It wasn't okay to hurt her image of a religious woman. Around this time, Mike almost died in a hunting accident, but Brian saved him. Denise saw an escape route all of a sudden. After the deal with the prosecutor is over, Brian will tell us the year 2000 which will lead us to talk about how Mike and Kathy died.
For Denise, she wanted everything to be blamed on me and not on her. She also wanted it to be an accident instead of a murder so she could deal with it. Brian and Denise chose a boating accident after thinking about other options. By doing this, they planned the murder to get the most money from Mike's life insurance policy. They both knew that Mike had to be killed before the end of December 2000, when one of the three policies ran out. The plan was set. Brian told his friend that he had found a great place to hunt on the shores of Lake Seminole. Mike planned to go with Brian and get back home by noon so he could spend his anniversary with his wife. I told him that we were going to go to a special place and that he absolutely had to bring his wading boots with him. I had to make sure he took them with him because it was believed that if you fell overboard in wading boots, you would drown very quickly. The plan was to make death look like unplanned drowning. Brain pushed Mike out of the boat once they were in the water. He almost drowned, but he climbed up on the stumps and started wading through them to get to the shore. Brian became scared. I didn't know what to do. Mike started calling loudly for help. I didn't know how to get out of this situation. I had a shotgun. I was panicking, and I shot him in the head. I didn't think about what I was doing. Things didn't go according to plan, and I needed to cover up what happened. There was hardly any time left. I should have been back home by now and getting ready to go hunting with my father-in-law. No one knew I was at the lake with Mike, so I decided it would be best for me to drive home and pretend like I had overslept. I drove home and hoped that Kathy was still asleep. Katie was asleep. My phone was on the floor. I went to bed, called my father-in-law and apologized. Brian did all he could to make an excuse for himself. Then he concealed the corpse. Denise didn't know that Brian had killed Mike with a gun and buried him. He tried to tell her, but she didn't want to hear him. She was happy that her husband was dead. For as long as Denise lived, she thought that God had kept him from swimming out and let him drown. Brian says that they promised each other that they would never talk to each other again. It was okay for Denise and Brian to do what they did because they said Mike was killed because they couldn't live together. Brain would say in court, we said the money was just the cherry on top. It turned out that Brian was the one who put down the hat, boots, flashlight, and license. First, he had to keep the searchers from leaving a lake. Then, he had to find a reason to declare Mike dead so Denise could get insurance. Usually this takes five years, but the lovers got it done in seven months with social security and other benefits added in. Denise got around $2 million. Denise Williams was charged with first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory to a felony on May 8, 2018. She could get life in prison if found guilty. Denise said she wasn't guilty of all three charges. She was given a life sentence in prison in February 2019. Five months later, Ansley, Mike, and Denise's daughter got all of her late father's property and the insurance money that Denise was owed. Denise Williams appealed her conviction and life sentence in January 2020. Her lawyer told Florida's First District Court of Appeal that there was no proof that she had anything to do with the murder. In November 2020, the murder conviction was thrown out but the 30-year sentence for planning to kill someone was kept. Denise is being held at the Florida Women's Reception Center right now. When she gets out, she will be 78 years old. To serve the rest of his sentence, Brian Winchester was sent to the Madison Correctional Institute in Florida. His current date to be freed is July 30, 2036. He'll be 67 years old. The daughter of Mike and Denise, Ansley, says her mother is not guilty and blames Brian Winchester. The woman wouldn't talk to any reporters about the case or her personal life. Cheryl and Nick Ansley's uncle says that they haven't been able to get in touch with Ansley. Cheryl is very sorry that she lost both her son and her granddaughter. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Ryan Smith was born in 1975 in San Diego, California, USA. He has always loved traveling and learning about other cultures. Ryan left his country at age 27 because he wanted to learn about the different kinds of people through their customs, languages, and traditions. This young man wanted to learn more about how people lived in Eurasia. 
especially in the countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. So in 2022, Ryan took his dreams and backpack to Azerbaijan, a country that used to be part of the Soviet Union. The Caspian Sea and the Caucasus Mountains surround the country, which is in a place that is kind of in the middle of Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Because of this, it was a great place for a young traveler to begin exploring the world. Ryan moved to Baku, which is the capital of Azerbaijan, and studied the language and culture there. He wrote on his website that he worked at a carpet market in a city with walls around it at that time. In this way, he learned about one of the oldest and most valuable crafts in the area. The skills needed to make carpets are passed down from one generation to the next. This is a tradition that has almost died out over the years. The young designer was amazed by how beautiful the items were and thought about how making handmade carpets could be a business. Ryan thought about his idea and came back to the United States in December 2005 to start building the project. He met Laura Joy, a young and beautiful teacher, while he was in the United States. They got engaged and then married. Laura encouraged her husband's interests in traveling and learning about other cultures. In 2011, the couple went to Georgia, which used to be part of the Soviet Union and borders Azerbaijan. In Georgia, in the city of Marnoli, two young people got married with plans to start making traditional carpets there. They were very young when they had a son in 2014 and named him Kleb. At the same time, Ryan and Laura were advertising their long-awaited project to weave their own carpets by hand. The American who worked on the project used traditional Azerbaijani techniques to make it possible for everything made with this technology to sell on the international market for more than $1,000. While Laura taught English at a nearby public school, her husband went to different villages in the area to find weavers who would be willing to work with them. Ryan was surprised to find that not many masters were still using the old ways. Some of the people who joined the plan at first refused to work with it for different reasons. Ryan's prices were not acceptable to all, and some people didn't know the original designer and weren't sure if they could meet the brand's needs. Ryan wrote on his blog that he spent four days in Kosolari, which is where he met artists who were interested in his project. Ryan didn't just want to make money or keep an ancient culture alive. He also wanted to become a public figure of goodwill by getting women from rural areas who know how to weave in old ways to join his project. This would give them the chance to bring back an old craft that would help them support their families. Quickly, Ryan and Laura Smith became one of the most admired couples, and the American visitor thought that a city with only 20,000 people living in it was the most expensive place to live. His wife, Laura, became friendly with the people in the city, taught and made a lot of friends. Ryan, on the other hand, earned respect by promoting the value of the ancient carpet weaving culture. Most people in the area thought the Smith couple were good people they could ask for help. A couple of Americans who came to visit got so used to the people, traditions, and culture that they applied for citizenship in 2012 and were soon citizens of both the U.S. and Georgia. Word on the street was that the couple was going to use their own money to build a kindergarten with a playground. Tragically, tragedy struck the couple in the most unexpected and terrifying way. Just as they were sure they had finally found a home and that the future looked bright for their family. In July 2018, Ryan, 43, and Laura, 42, were going to take a few days off to go on vacation with their little dog, Kleb, and get away from their normal lives. Laura's friend Sabina Talabova said that Laura called her on July 4 to tell her about her plans to go to the mountains and let them know they would be gone for two days. The couple chose to go to a small, beautiful place near the Godori Mountains that no one would see. You can go for walks and have picnics in this area, which is known for its trails, beautiful waterfalls, and stunning gorges. Instead of getting away from things and finding peace of mind in this quiet corner, the Smith family had their worst nightmare come true. They wanted to find a local person to act as their guide so they wouldn't get lost and could travel through the mountains without being scared. The parents also wanted to make sure that little Kleb was safe and that the trip would not be too long or hard for the baby. Finally, they met Malkaz Kober, a shepherd from the area. He didn't live here, 
but he knew the area well because he took his sheep and goats to graze there every day. People in Malkaz's area thought he was a good guy because he was always calm. The Smith family hired Malkaz as a guide because they had heard good things about him and knew the area. It wasn't long after they left for the mountains that the couple learned about Malkaz's terrible plans and claims. It turned out that the group went out on the mountain and when they got to the clearing set up camp for dinner. In order to get fresh water in the middle of the summer, they chose a spot near one of the many springs in the area. There was a time when Ryan must have paid attention to his guide because he thought he wasn't being careful enough with the gun he always carried. There was a heated argument between the two men and no one thought Malkaz would shoot Ryan in the head with a gun. After that, he shot the man in the back again. The baby's crying and Laura's screams of fear drowned out the sounds of gunfire in the mountains, but the worst was yet to come. Even though the woman begged him not to, Malkaz put the gun to Kleb's head and fired straight at him. Laura turned into stone because she was scared and didn't know what was going on. But when she saw Malkaz's cold eyes, she knew what he really wanted. Her instinct to protect herself worked. Sarah ran as fast as she could to stay safe and keep her husband and son from getting hurt. But when she got to the edge of the waterfall cliff, she saw that she couldn't get away. The shepherd is said to have pushed the woman off a cliff and then hit her with a weapon. It is where Laura's body fell into the water. The investigation that followed said that Malkaz buried Kleb's body in a remote area and also sent the murder weapon there. The shepherd then went back to the village like nothing had happened. Sabina, Laura's friend, started to worry when she hadn't heard from her for three days after a family trip. Shiana tried calling Ryan and Laura, but never heard back. Another group of people who were with Ryan were also confused because he hadn't called anyone in a long time. On July 6th, someone called the Center for Rapid Response and Emergency Situations to say that a Georgian family with American roots might have gone missing in the mountains. The caller was Sabina, and she said that the Smith family and their four-year-old son had been in the mountains for more than two days and could not be reached by phone. Fifteen rescuers were sent to the gorge to look for a family that was thought to be missing. When rescuers got to the designated area, they found Laura's things and car. But as the searchers went further along the small group's path, they came across something terrible. At the base of the waterfall, there was a dead body. Rescuers who were lost stepped up their efforts and expanded their search area. About 800 meters from the waterfall, the body of a person was found. Because of the season's high humidity and heat, the body broke down faster. So at first, the police said the victims didn't show any signs of violence. An investigation was started because that's what the Georgian criminal code says should happen. But no one knew anything about the little girl. It was clear what would happen to the helpless baby after three more days. Investigators were able to figure out that Malkaz was the last person the family talked to. It was said that the 19-year-old shepherd knew where Kleb was while he was being questioned. On the fourth day, after the Smith family went to the mountains, Malkaz showed police where he buried Kleb and the gun. The next day, Georgian police said in a statement that Malkaz Kabari, a young shepherd, had been arrested and was being held on suspicion of killing the Smith family. The news that a married couple and their son had been killed shocked everyone in Georgia especially the weavers in Marnuli. It was also said by the American consulate that this crime was very scary. Together with the Georgian police, an FBI team actually took part in the investigation and helped look for and process evidence. The charges against Malkaz were dropped by the Tbilisi Municipal Court on July 11th, but he was still arrested. The conductor said that two foreigners who came in a black car were the real killers of the family. It is said that these people killed the Smith family and threatened to kill him and his family if he called the police. They then left Malkaz alive so that the shepherd would be blamed for killing three people. Malkaz's lawyer said that he couldn't do anything violent to Laura because the man said he wasn't ready for that since he was still a virgin. People from Ryan's family, friends, and public advocacy groups gathered in front of his Marnuli home on July 12th with toys, flowers, and lit candles to show their support and remember the victims. The next day, Malkaz's lawyer confirmed that the accused person was not guilty. 
He went on to say that the crime was done by two foreigners and that his client Malkaz initially pleaded guilty because of psychological pressure. However, proof against Malkaz started to show up one piece at a time. The autopsy report of the victims was the strongest proof that Malkaz was guilty. Two bullet holes were found in Ryan's body, one in the head and one in the back. Kleb was shot in the head from right in front of him. DNA tests proved that the biological material found in Laura's body and on her underwear belonged to Malkaz, and it was proven that she had been abused. The killer's and Ryan's DNA were both found on the murder weapon, a technical check of the phones of the victims and the person they say killed them by the FBI also revealed that Malkaz's phone had pictures of Laura's dead body at the waterfall. The shepherd even showed them to some people he knew in the area and told them that he had found a dead body while walking through these areas by accident. The phone's search history showed that Malkaz had been to a number of sexually explicit sites a few days before the incident. Investigators came to the conclusion that the young man's interest in Laura was the reason he did what he did and that he knew what he was doing from the moment the Smith family called Malkaz to take them to the waterfall. David, Malkaz's lawyer, quit after the autopsy results came out, saying that he could not defend the shepherd for moral reasons. As soon as David was taken off the case, it was taken over by another lawyer. He insisted that the client was innocent and asked for Malkaz's previous confession to be thrown out. Mariana, the shepherd's mother, stood by her son and agreed with the lawyer that the police may have used the threat of jail time to get the guy to confess to the crime. Family members of the suspect said that the police accused Malkaz to close the case because the crime was well known. But on November 9, 2018, Malkaz was charged with killing three Smith family members. Besides those charges, he was also charged with assaulting Laura. A psychological test of the young shepherd showed that he is healthy, sane and ready to be put on trial. Before his trial, Malkaz was being held in jail until April 9, 2019, but the prosecutor said they had strong proof of his guilt and that he would be punished for such a terrible crime. A group of 12 judges met on March 25, 2019, and all of them agreed that Malkaz was guilty of killing more than two people with extreme cruelty. He planned to kill someone in order to hide another crime which was assault on March 27, 2019. The judge in Gori District announced that the criminal would be sent to prison for life. The criminal's family members protested the life sentence, which they thought was unfair. Friends and family of the Smith family were relieved by the sentence, and the defense lawyers said they would appeal the verdict to the appellate instances because they thought there had been errors in the process. The U.S. Consul in Georgia said that the verdict was fair for the Smith family, and that there was no doubt that Malkaz was guilty. The people of Marnuli have loved and respected Ryan and Laura Smith ever since they moved to Georgia. Their brutal murder has been a blow to the community that the couple chose to call home. Not only did Ryan's community project bring back an old tradition, it also gave many women a way to make money and feel safe. Dozens of women who wanted to run their own businesses were sad and uncertain when their husbands died. Soon after the terrible events that killed the founders, the project was brought back to life by foreign investors who support Ryan's ideas and give local craftsmen jobs. After leaving the life they knew in the West, Ryan and Laura went to Asia to find cultural treasures. Along with being greeted by grateful people in the community, they came across a dangerous being who pretended to be a kind shepherd. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. It's a terrible and often destructive emotion that can make someone blind and make them do bad things. The terrible event that happened in Costa Rica a few years ago was caused by jealousy. In the history of forensics, this case is known as the case of Gerardo Cruz. But let's go through everything in order. The year he was born was February 1975 in Costa Rica. Not much is known about her family when she was young. The girl grew up in a place called Cuba, with her mother, Sonia Fonseca. Samadhi went to one of the nearby schools. Even when he was young, 
he showed that he was a difficult and troubled person. People in the area who knew her say she wouldn't put up with being turned down and that she often got what she wanted by force or lying. Samadhi's beautiful looks and perfect body made it easy for men to fall in love with her, but she couldn't keep them. She was very pretty and knew how to make the most of her looks, but she put money and her own needs above all else out of greed and vanity, which turned off her suitors after a short time together. In her younger years, she was also very angry and jealous. Because she looks like a doll, Samadhi Fonseca worked for a few years as Barbie in one of the big bookstores owned by the Universal Company. It was during this time that the girl got a nickname that made her feel good and stuck with her forever. Samadhi had an affair with a successful reporter who worked on local TV not long after she graduated from high school. Her age difference with the man was 16 years. His name was Osvaldo Fernando Baleri. Samadhi was in her longest and most serious relationship, but Baleri never asked her to marry him. They had a son named Christopher in 1996 and a daughter named Christina the next year. He broke up with the young woman in 2012, though, because of constant scandals and jealousy. He died suddenly at the age of 53. Not long after Baleri died, Samadhi made the choice to do something on her own. She went to the house of her ex-lover and took it by changing the locks so that the family and heirs of the dead person could not get in. Samadhi also took some valuable things that belonged to the person who died. The Ballery family was very angry and went to court right away to punish Samadhi for stealing. The young woman was told to leave the house by the police, but she was not charged with a crime. Fonseca was in a lot of other relationships besides Miguel Angel Perez. She had her third child, a daughter named Maria, with him. Some reports say that this relationship was registered, but after a few years, they got a divorce. Some sources, though, say that Samadhi wasn't married. She also gave her lover's last name to her youngest daughter, without telling him or getting his permission. Although it's interesting that some of Barbie's lovers have mysteriously vanished or died in strange ways, no one paid much attention to this for a long time. As an example, one of Samadhi's lovers disappeared soon after he broke up with a woman who was rude and angry. The man has still not been found, and many people are sure that Fonseca has something to do with this case. However, strong proof of her guilt could not be found. Diaco, Samadhi's other ex-lover, died in a terrible accident after they broke up. He was killed, and it looked like someone tried to rob him but failed. It was never found out who killed those people. Again, a lot of people thought Samadhi had something to do with the crime, but no solid proof was found against her. But Gerardo Cruz was her most well-known victim. For Cruz, Costa Rica is home. He was born in San Jose in December 1992. He had never met his own father because the boy's real father had left the family before he was born. His mother, Anna Patricia, soon got married to Hermes Rodriguez. Rodriguez took the baby in and raised him as his own. After a few years, Gerardo got a sister named Milena. When the guy was young, he was calm and didn't worry about anything. His school was like any other. He liked motorcycles, and he met his true love, a girl named Carol, early in life. When Gerardo was 23, he moved in with his girlfriend and their four-year-old daughter, Genesis Cruz. They lived with his aunt and uncle in the suburb of San Sebastian. To make sure his family had everything they needed, the young father got a job at a nearby bakery. He and his wife were very happy. Soon they found out for the second time that they were going to have a baby. Gerardo met Samadhi in the summer of 2015, when Samadhi was shopping at the bakery where Gerardo worked. The woman was 40 years old at the time, but she was still very pretty, liked dressing in sexy ways, and flirted with younger men. As she got older, she started having affairs with men who were much younger than her. The attention from younger lovers probably made her feel good, even though they were almost 20 years younger than her. Even though the beautiful woman was with Cruz's family, Cruz quickly fell in love with her and started meeting with her in secret. The fact that she started going to the bakery almost every day to see her young lover caught the attention of other workers. Along with Samadhi, her oldest daughter Christina, who was 19 years old at the time, often showed up with her. 
At first, Gerardo did a great job of keeping his family life in check while meeting with his mistress in secret. Neither of the women in his life knew about the other. But soon, Gerardo, as they call him, let down his guard. To show off how good he was with women, he started to brag to his friends and co-workers about Samadhi and how she was a great mistress and gave him lots of gifts. The news quickly got to his mother, who tried to talk sense into her son and get him to leave his mistress. A few months into the relationship, Samadhi learned that her lover was pregnant and had a young daughter. They broke up in October of that year, 2015. The woman was so mad that she called and texted Carol, calling her names and threatening to kill Gerardo if he didn't belong to her alone. Gerardo was able to ask his wife to forgive him and keep the family together. When it came to his ex-lover, he didn't pay attention to her threats because he thought she would quickly calm down and find a new boyfriend. It's possible that he had no idea how sneaky and mean Samadhi would be. A mere few days after breaking up with Fonseca, Cruz happened upon a very public event. The young man was walking down a street in downtown when he saw an older man following a young girl while holding his phone so that the camera was under her miniskirt. The guy was so angry that he pulled out his phone and started recording what was going on. He then stopped the girl, told her everything, and told her to call the police. Cruz then went after the man and tried to take a picture of his face. He went after him for about two minutes and loudly asked him if he was having fun taking pictures of the girl's underwear without her knowledge. The man then got into a taxi and drove off. That same night, Gerardo posted the video he had made on his website. In just one night, the video went viral and users quickly figured out that the old man was Luis Sulmano Delgado, a former official who worked for the Ministry of Finance. The media quickly picked up the video and spread it across the country, making Gerardo a national star. The young man was asked to be on TV and radio shows and was interviewed almost every day for print publications. He talked about what he had seen, said that the former official had done something wrong, and said that he had no regrets and would do it again. Aside from that, Skilled lawyers hired by Sulmano Delgado started to work against Gerardo, accusing him of doing something wrong. They said that sharing the guy's videotape with other people was against the law, and they were getting ready to sue him in court. In fact, Cruz was shocked by what happened and didn't understand why they could judge him, but not the man who had done such a horrible thing to a girl. On October 7th, Gerardo did his last interview on the air of a locale radio station. He was sure he was right and didn't think he had anything to worry about. Gerardo had planned to meet up with his friend Oswald after work the next day, but he suddenly called off the meeting, saying he had to take care of something important. Later, he learned that that day, he got a message from Samadhi. In it, the young woman tricked him into going to the park in the evening for another interview. Gerardo didn't think anything was wrong, he just believed his ex-lover. When his shift was over, he went to the agreed-upon location, but there were no reporters waiting for him. Not long after, two unknown men showed up and took his bag. They then beat him and stabbed him several times in the chest and stomach before running away. Before he passed out, the hurt man was able to call his friend and tell them what happened. His friend then called the police and ambulance services right away. Gerardo was taken to the hospital right away and doctors there fought for 42 days to save his life. During this time, Gerardo had a lot of surgeries, but they were not able to save him. The 19th of November, Cruz passed away in the ICU. Since not long before the tragedy, he had become a real celebrity, and the whole country knew about his condition. In interviews that they did from time to time, Gerardo's family asked everyone to pray for his recovery. That's why they didn't know who or why could hurt Gerardo in that way. People from all over came to the young man's funeral to show their support for his family. They all hoped that the killers would be caught quickly by the police and given a fair punishment. At first, there were different stories about what happened. The first idea was that it was a murder robbery. In fact, Gerardo was attacked in the park at night, his bag was stolen, and he was stabbed with a knife which made it look like a normal theft. But just a few days before, Cruz put out a shocking video that implicated a well-known former official. So the second idea was that the person was killed in revenge. The media said and wrote that Sulmano Delgado might have hired hitmen to kill the young man, whose actions had hurt his reputation. 
The murder got a lot of attention in the news, and people took to the streets to demand that the killers be caught and punished. The police thought about different stories and looked for other people who might be Gerardo's enemies or people who wanted him to hurt. There was no progress in the investigation for a few months until May 2016, when a video from a street camera was found. There was video of two men running away from the place where Cruz was killed. These men were right away thought to be responsible, but it was up to the police to figure out who they were and find them. The tape was an important piece of evidence, and the case moved forward after it was made public. It was shown over and over on news shows, and people were told to pay close attention because these people could be dangerous criminals. The police could also make rough sketches of the men they were looking for and talk about their anthropometric data. Soon, one of the men's identities was known because he chose to turn himself in to the police and help with the investigation in the hopes that it would help him get a lighter sentence. Because he gave them information, the police were able to quickly find several other criminals who worked with him and the people who planned the crime. Soon, Samadi and her daughter Christina were taken into custody. Along with the mother and daughter, three other men were arrested. A cab driver named Ronald Arce, who had found the murderers, a worker named Cesar Chavez, who had acted as a go-between, and a young Miner who had been directly involved in the attack. Later, Omar Costa was also arrested. He had been following the victim and telling people where he was on the day of the attack. Phone calls and text messages were used to figure out what each person's role was and how they were connected to the crime. Samedi gave the order for the murder and had carefully planned the whole thing, even including telling her daughter Christina about it. To find hitmen to kill Gerardo, they asked their friends Ronald and Cesar for help. They wanted to make it look like a failed robbery in a park at night. Later, Omar joined them. It was his job to make sure the victim went to the agreed-upon place. Samadhi picked October 7th as the day of the attack. That day, she called all the people involved in the crime several times, gave them jobs, and made sure everyone stuck to the plan. In addition, the young woman demanded that they bring her some of her ex-lover's things as proof after they did the crime. Cruz thought he was going to an interview, when he left work and went straight to the park. He tried not to be late for the meeting, but he was attacked and stabbed several times. His bag and jacket were then taken, and the customer was given them as proof. The texts that showed Samadhi was guilty were the main proof. They clearly explained the murder plan and who was responsible for what. The woman was so sure that she could get away with it that she didn't even delete them. The woman did such a horrible thing because she was plain jealous. She didn't want to share her lover with his wife and thought that no one else would want him if he wasn't with her. She planned everything out and included her own daughter in her crime. Her daughter helped her with every part of the plan. The mother and daughter were arrested right away and it was clear that they couldn't be freed on bail because the criminals would probably try to get away and leave the country. Their helpers were also put in jail before their trials, but Omar, who was in charge of surveillance and the youngest person involved in the crime, were given to authorities who deal with juvenile offenders. The investigation took about a year and a half, and the trial of everyone involved in the crime plot didn't start until December 2017. It also turned out that Samadhi had been charged with crimes before. In particular, she was arrested for making fake papers to get money from the government, but she only had to pay a fine. The story of Miguel Angel Perez has also come to light. He is the father of Samadhi's youngest daughter, it turned out that the young woman gave the child the last name of a man she used to date without his permission. Afterward, she used the court to get him to pay her alimony, which she did for more than three years. When it was discovered that the whole process was fake, the con artist was given three years in prison and a big fine. The court did change her sentence though because she had a young child. The five-year sentence was placed on hold. The murder victim's wife, Gerardo, admitted in court that she knew about his affair with Samadhi and that Samadhi had threatened to kill him. He did not pay much attention to the threats though. The main reason for the crime was, as was already said, the woman's anger and pride because she couldn't accept that her young lover wanted to stay with his wife. The call logs showed that the mother and daughter planned the crime together. It was also made public that Christine had a nervous breakdown 
after the CCTV footage of the killers was made public. In tears, she called her mother and was about to tell the police what she had done. She tried to calm her daughter down by telling her that the investigation would never show who they were. The verdict wasn't made public until January 23, 2018. The court's decision said that Samadhi would spend 30 years in prison. Ronald, Caesar, her daughter, and her sister all got 25 years in prison. One of the killers went to a place for young offenders to stay, but the other was not found at that time. Omar, who had been following the victim, was found not guilty though. As moral compensation, $140,000 was given to the victim's family. The killers of Gerardo were given a fair sentence, which the family thanked the court for after the verdict was read. That being said, it was quickly made public that Samadhi and Christina's lawyers had asked the appeals court to lower the sentences. It was tried again in November 2019. At the same time, the second killer's name came to light. According to Ronald, this person took part in the killings, but did not know the details of the plan. Ronald and Caesar also went to the appeals court to try to get the sentence shortened. Because of this, each person involved in the crime got five years taken off their sentence. At this point, Samadhi is serving her 25-year sentence in a Costa Rican prison for women. Samadhi, on the other hand, will spend almost 20 years in prison. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. This is exactly what Kanyong's story is about. You might ask, is this really possible? How could a simple family dinner lead to a brutal murder that will shock everyone in Malaysia? The law will even be looked at by the local government. Let us look at this case. Princess Kani Ong Lake Yang is her full name. She was born in 1974 in Ipoh, Malaysia into a big family. People from all over the world visit the city, but Kani had her sights set on something else. A better job and traveling. What else could a girl want? That being said, she knew that she had to work for her dream and that nothing good could just happen. First, Kani got a gold medal in high school. Then she went to the University of Hawaii and got a degree in economics here. After the start, more work had to be done to make things better. She went to Los Angeles and got a job at an advertising agency. She was already living on her own. The city of dreams helped the girl see herself as an expert in her field. In 2001, Kani met Brandon Ong there. He was born in Singapore, like her father, but moved to the United States with his family when he was a child and was now legally an American. Young Kani and Brandon quickly got married and moved to San Diego, which is right next door. But after only two years together, something bad happened. Kani's dad got liver cancer. The surgery her father was going to have in Malaysia was very serious and it wasn't clear if he would live or die after it. She quickly packed her things and flew to her father on June 1st, leaving her husband in the United States. The surgery went well, the disease got better, and the doctor said that Kani's dad, who they called B-Gen, would live a long time and definitely have grandchildren. Kani let out a sigh of relief. At last, she could go back to her husband and her favorite job. In the morning, she took a plane to Los Angeles, that night, Kani invited her whole family to a farewell dinner at Montes, their favorite restaurant that they used to go on vacation when Kani still lived with her parents. During dinner, Kani's mom got sick out of the blue and her sweet daughter offered to drive her home. She spent a long time looking for a parking ticket in her purse in the parking lot. When she couldn't find it, she realized she had left it in her car and forgotten about it. Kani then ran to the car and told her sisters to watch her mother. She wasn't seen for a long time. Her mother went to the car to check on her, but neither Canny's nor her daughters were there. When one of the sisters tried to call Canny's phone, it was even scarier to see that it was turned off. Her family knew her very well. She couldn't just disappear, and she would always call to let them know what had happened. But what could have happened in a parking lot that was locked up, only 300 feet from her family? The father of Canny asked the security guards to show him the video footage. His daughter was walking toward the car and checking her pockets and purse for her keys. At first, there was nothing strange about it. 
When they looked back, they saw a stranger moving behind Canny. He was speeding up and slowing down, just like Canny. The guards and Canny's worried father watched her car leave the parking lot from a different camera. There was a man behind the wheel, most likely the one who had followed her in the parking lot. It was strange that Canny was sitting in the passenger seat. The family called the police right away because it looked like someone was taking their child. People should praise the Malaysian police for starting to look for the missing woman as soon as they learned that the car had been stolen. After a few hours, a highway patrol officer saw a car on the road that fit the description. The police stopped the car to look at the papers so as not to scare the possible kidnapper. At the time, they weren't sure if it was a kidnapping or not for sure. The driver of the car stopped and gave the police officer his license, even though he looked tense. He tried to show the policeman some signs while sitting next to him, but the officer was busy checking the driver's license. He didn't understand, which is a shame. Kidnapper, on the other hand, paid attention, stepped on the gas, and drove away from the police car. The police shot at the car, but it got away. They still had the kidnapper's papers, though. His name was Ahmad Najib bin Aris, and he was 27 years old. Let me give you a short history of this person. They were born in 1976 and raised in Muar, Malaysia. He was the second child in a family of four. Ahmad Najib went to secondary school until the third year, but then he quit. He didn't go to the last two years of secondary school. In Malaysia, secondary school lasts for five years. He had to work to feed his family, and he worked hard. He went from Muar to Kuala Lumpur in 1998. In the end, Ahmad Najib got married and had two kids. Ahmad Najib was a good man who did his job well, according to people who knew him. Now let's get back to our case. After some time, it became clear that the shooting at the car had an effect. A young man went up to the police and told them a strange story. He told the story of a stranger who approached him at a roadside cafe while he was eating dinner. The stranger said that he was on vacation with his wife but had a flat tire on the way and could not go any further. The young man was happy to help the stranger. He got a jack from the trunk and gave it to the traveler when they got outside. But he saw bullet holes in the car, and in the front seat, he saw a scared woman who didn't look like a wife taking a carefree vacation with her husband. But the so-called husband didn't change the tire himself. He just played around with the jack for a while, complained, and then gave it back. The police knew right away that it was canny, and that Ahmad was the one who took her. But that was the last time anyone saw Kani alive. Not long after on the third day, Kaniong, or rather her body, was found in a sewer manhole near a construction site. It was almost completely burned to the ground. The autopsy will show that the woman was stabbed several times in the stomach and then choked to death. Another thing that was found nearby the construction site was Kani's car, which had a shot tire and blood on the back seat. Even though the police had the killer's paperwork, they didn't go to Ahmad's house until after the body was found. For some reason, really interesting thing about this story is that the killer was at home, acting like nothing had happened, like he had. It was like he hadn't stolen someone else's car, kidnapped a woman who had come to see her sick father, and then driven away from police officers who were shooting at him. After Ahmad was caught, Forensic tests showed that the car also had Ahmad's DNA in it, along with Kani's blood. To be clear, we want to say that murders in Malaysia are very uncommon, especially ones that are so violent. According to the criminal code, someone who kills someone deserves the death penalty, not even life in prison in this case. Ahmad knew that the police had all the information on him, so it's not clear what he was hoping for. He admitted everything and even agreed to help with the investigation because he thought that would keep him from being put to death. Of course, the cruel criminal hid his identity at the trial by pretending to be a sheep. In the parking lot that night, he said, he was looking for a different woman, but thought he saw the wrong woman. He didn't realize it until he was in the car with Canny. He even said that they laughed about it together, and he later tried to get her to have sex with him. Again, he said that Canny wasn't even against it, and the marks on her neck from being strangled were just part of the woman's sexual fantasy, which is why she died. Ahmad, who was scared, decided to get rid of the body by setting Kani on fire. 
From beginning to end, Ahmad's lawyers made up this story because if they had been proven true, they would have only been found guilty of abusing the dead or, in the worst case, negligently killing Canny during the sexual encounter. If this isn't true and the defendant's crazy thoughts are all this, the lawyer said, then why didn't the captive run away while her captor changed the tire? If the person hadn't been stabbed in the stomach, this story might even sound plausible. The defense fell apart like a house of cards at this point. It was clear because the investigation had a different, more reliable account of what had happened, which was backed up by the autopsy. Ahmad saw a woman by herself in the parking lot outside of Monty's and followed her. When Canny opened her car door, he pointed a knife at her and told her to sit in the passenger seat. He then got behind the wheel himself. After the incident with the police and the failed attempt to fix a flat tire, he took the car to a place with no one else around, put Canny in the back seat, and used her more than once. When Canny tried to fight back, she was stabbed several times in the stomach and then strangled with a coat belt. Ahmad took her already dead body outside, threw it into the first manhole, and then put tires over it so no one would find it. His plan was to finally hide the evidence of the crime when he came back to this manhole the next day with several gas cans. He put gasoline in Canny's body and set it on fire. It turned out that Ahmad had also raped four women, luckily none of whom died. They did not report it to the police because they were afraid of being caught, though. After what seemed like years, the court finally found the murderer guilty on February 23, 2005. Among other things, they gave Ahmad ten lashes. Was this any better for the parents who had lost their daughter for good? Ahmad tried to appeal his sentence while he was in jail. He even wrote a letter to Salangor, the head of state, asking him to release him, but he was turned down. Ahmad got what was coming to him just 13 years after killing Canny. He was hanged in his cell on September 23, 2016. As I already said, this case got a lot of attention in Malaysia. People in the area were scared, not so much by the brutality of the murder and Ahmad's seemingly false belief that he would not be caught, but by the fact that it is not hard to kidnap someone in a busy shopping center, even if it's in a parking lot. To make sure this didn't happen again, the Malaysian government started to put up as many CCTV cameras as they could all over the country. They also hired more security guards for shopping malls and even made parking spots just for women. For these reasons, it is very sad that the life of an innocent woman who flew from tens of thousands of miles away to be with her father for two weeks had to be sacrificed. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In April 2016, in Fort Worth, Texas, a shocking and brutal murder startled even experienced investigators. Elizabeth Paula Arellano worked as a paramedic before falling victim to this vicious and senseless act. Prepare to be shocked as you discover who carried out Elizabeth's execution. Her death was so peculiar that the police initially suggested it might have been voluntary. However, this explanation didn't align with the testimony provided by accidental witnesses to this tragic scene. Investigation teams had to go the extra mile in their efforts to understand everything and bring justice against the individual who committed this extremely brutal crime. Unfortunately, given his conduct, his sentence appeared too lenient and unfair compared to many others. Elizabeth Paula Arellano was born on August 16, 1987 in Fort Worth, Texas where she would live her short life. Elizabeth spent much of her childhood alongside Alessandra and Giovanna, whom she found to be her companions. Elizabeth's birth father left when she was still young, showing no interest in or contact with his daughter. Soon thereafter, her mother, Juanita, remarried Fidel, who eventually treated their children as his own. Elizabeth developed an extremely close bond with Fidel, who supported and assisted in every way possible in all family matters. The girl studied diligently at school and dreamed of one day becoming a doctor. While in high school, she met Rudolf Arellano, whom she soon fell in love with. Elizabeth chose a man almost eight years older than herself, causing some embarrassment among her parents. Nonetheless, they did not interfere with the romance, as their son-in-law appeared serious and reliable enough for them not to intervene. 
At 16 years old, just out of school, Elizabeth legally married her lover. Elizabeth and James eventually had four children together, three sons and a daughter. However, Elizabeth did not intend to become a housewife, as she remembered her childhood dream of becoming a doctor, and she graduated from medical school to work as a paramedic while planning to pursue further education. The young woman was kind and devoutly raised in Christian traditions. She took her children regularly to church and instilled in them love and compassion for their neighbors. Family and friends recognized her as an attentive listener who was always willing to lend a helping hand. At first, their marriage seemed strong and blissful, but after 13 years, it began to unravel as Rudolph tried his hardest to control every aspect of her life, becoming increasingly inconsiderate over time. Eventually, their union disintegrated entirely as his jealousy of his young wife became uncontrollable. After yet another jealousy-fueled argument initiated by Rudolph, Elizabeth took her children and moved them back to her parents' house. Although Rudolph attempted reconciliation with Elizabeth, she had grown tired of his fits of anger and didn't want the children exposed daily to their scandalous arguments. She mustered enough courage to officially file for a divorce, and shortly thereafter, she mysteriously vanished without a trace. According to friends and family, she appeared in good spirits and decided, in order to distract herself from family problems and the impending divorce, to visit a nearby club after work with colleagues. On Friday evening, April 15, 2016, the 28-year-old mother went to a fun place with some friends. There, she danced and had fun but did not consume alcohol due to her plans to return in her own car, which she had used to arrive at the club. Elizabeth arrived home well past midnight on April 16th. Once she parked the car, she called her friend, with whom she had spent the evening at the club, to inform them that she had already reached home and that everything was okay. However, after hanging up the phone, she never entered the house. The next morning, Juanita became very distressed to find that Elizabeth had not returned home as planned. Although Juanita knew Elizabeth had planned on spending the evening with friends, she expected Elizabeth would have returned long ago, as her car had been parked outside their house, indicating her return from the club. Juanita approached Elizabeth's car, only to find it unlocked with its key still in the ignition. Inside were Elizabeth's purse and cell phone belongings, indicating that something horrible must have occurred. As soon as she noticed Elizabeth was missing, Juanita immediately notified the police and filed a missing person report. At first, the police believed they could quickly solve the case with hot leads, hoping Elizabeth might still be alive, as there was no blood or signs of struggle visible inside the car. However, that proved not to be the case, and their first priority became reconstructing every aspect of that evening and night for all possible witnesses who might help identify and interrogate. Friends and colleagues of the young woman who spent the evening before she disappeared were interviewed providing details about when she left and returned home. Additionally, several calls and messages from Rudolf Arellano, who was trying to contact Elizabeth throughout that evening, were found on her cell phone, all without success, as Elizabeth never answered his calls or texts. Police officers visited Rudolf's home the evening and night prior to ascertain his whereabouts and activities. According to Rudolf, he had spoken with his ex-spouse that night who assured him she would bring their children over for the weekend visitation. But after she stopped answering his calls, he believed she had changed her mind and abandoned him. Arellano offered up an unlikely alibi. According to him, he spent the evening sitting at a local bar before returning home at midnight and going straight to sleep. On Friday afternoon, Rudolph was confirmed by his friends and others to have been relaxing in the same establishment. However, no one knew where he went after that and there was no one to verify his claim. So, the police were unwilling to exclude Mr. Arellano as a suspect due to his lack of an alibi, and his behavior raised further suspicions. At his ex-wife's funeral, Rudolph put on a show, weeping at her coffin and telling Elizabeth that he wanted her death as much as his own. Elizabeth believed in the sincerity of these statements. Furthermore, he actively assisted in creating a charitable foundation to raise money for her farewell ceremony. However, after the conclusion of this act, when police investigators called him in for questioning again, he looked and behaved completely differently 
as though nothing bad had taken place compared to what Elizabeth had witnessed before at that point in time. After reviewing all the CCTV footage from the last several weeks, a thorough assessment was completed. Under Elizabeth's route, it was determined that a car of similar make and color to Rudolph's had driven away from her parents' house at 3 a.m., according to witness accounts. A neighbor also remembers seeing this same vehicle parked not far from where Elizabeth had been killed on a nearby bridge. Furthermore, investigators raised more questions when they obtained Rudolph's cell phone data for the night of the crime. On that night, Rudolph made multiple calls near Elizabeth's place of employment and then near his mother-in-law and father-in-law's homes, as well as sending his ex-wife several messages trying to find out when she would return, but none were returned by her. He followed her to Elizabeth's parents' home, where he decided to wait. Once the police had enough evidence against Rudolph, they arrested and brought him into the station for further questioning. One of the key witnesses in Elizabeth and Rudolph's case was their eldest son. When shown the rope that had been cut from Elizabeth's neck, he reported having seen it earlier at his father's house, recalling playing with it himself. Furthermore, the boy recognized pieces of concrete left lying around their garden after their fence had been replaced. Fragments from this concrete could even be found inside Rudolph's car trunk. The investigation revealed that the man waited for his ex-wife at her parents' home before abducting her and forcing her into his car, where he had prepared rope and concrete in the trunk for use during the massacre at a nearby bridge. He planned on going unnoticed while carrying out this act of violence. Rudolph Arellano was arrested 10 days after his ex-wife's body was recovered from a lake, but denied all involvement in her murder, claiming he had been at home on that particular night. Given the severity of Rudolph's actions, death could have been imminent until, after consulting with his lawyer, he decided to confess and cooperate with the investigation to lessen his sentence. Arellano did not plead guilty until January 2019 when he presented evidence in court detailing how he abducted and murdered Juanita, the mother of their four children. Juanita fainted during his testimony, while Alessandra and Giovanna called Arellano a monster. Rudolph himself did not express any regret for his crime or apologize to those affected by it. Rather, he spoke nonchalantly and coldly about it, without offering an explanation for his motivations or actions. For this crime, he was sentenced to life without parole. Elizabeth's family members considered this sentence rather mild, noting that they forgave Rudolph because they did not want their hearts to be consumed by hatred towards him. Elizabeth is now responsible for raising her children, as her parents and sisters are responsible for providing care. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Detective Jeremy Ogden from the Hobart, Indiana Police Department gazed upon a manuscript that had kept him busy for months. It revealed an emotionally wrenching tale involving 53-year-old Christopher Reagan's tragic story. Born in Detroit, Michigan, and receiving his education there, Christopher decided at the age of 20 to join those willing to protect their country by enlisting as an active duty soldier. Upon being accepted into service with honor and devotion by standing guard over citizens' peace, he forever changed his destiny with his choice to join. Christopher was sent to a military base near Marquette. While there, fate brought Christopher together with Terry from Iron River. Their friendship developed over time after meeting as young people often do on city streets. Shy people may hesitate to say hello, but they eventually began walking together and became closer friends over time. They remained close for years since Christopher's service prevented any chance for more meaningful relationships to form between them. At one point, Chris decided to leave military service and move to Traverse City, located nearby but far from where his beloved lived. But this did not become an obstacle to their feelings. On the contrary, communication became even stronger between them. Christopher proposed to Terry that they start an extended romantic relationship, knowing each other for years but never violating any boundaries or ethical rules. 
She readily agreed, and their long-distance romance began shortly afterward. Soon enough, Christopher and Terry realized they shared many interests, from appreciating nature, to preferring an organized lifestyle, to yearning for peace. Iron River became their ideal location, and they decided to move together. Christopher moved in with Terry, while finding employment at a factory producing parts for military ships. Soon enough, he even had subordinates who reported directly to him. Life was finally looking bright, but after two years, complications arose in their relationship. With passion slowly diminishing, as Christopher and Terry failed to address its difficulties, it eventually became evident that this could not continue, and they took the difficult decision to part ways peacefully and remain friendly toward each other. Christopher realized he could no longer continue living at Terry's house, so he decided to rent his own place instead. As time progressed, Chris realized he wanted a change of scenery as well. Iron River seemed too small, so Chris began looking for more dynamic cities like Asheville and North Carolina. Fate presented Christopher with the chance to start over and embark on an entirely new chapter of life. Not only would Asheville provide him with job opportunities, but it would also offer picturesque, natural attractions, perfect conditions to launch himself into life anew. Christopher told Terry on October 14th that he had taken off work due to a doctor's appointment, suggesting they meet and go for a walk as they often did while living together. Christopher then proposed they meet later that afternoon and join her. Terry became worried when Christopher failed to contact her after October 15th and didn't return any calls or text messages from her girlfriend, Terry. Concerned for Christopher, Terry reached out to mutual friends, but they knew nothing. Ten days later, she filed a police report regarding Christopher's disappearance. Terry filed a report, but police quickly comforted her, assuring her that people often disappear for periods of time, only to return at some later point, sometimes even ending up somewhere new. Additionally, Terry revealed to police officers that Christopher had recently received a job offer in North Carolina. For them, this was another indicator that Christopher may have reached his new residence and begun living a completely different life after having cut all ties with the past. Investigators quickly launched an extensive investigation to disprove speculations. To do this, they identified Christopher's newly hired company and spoke to one of its employees to discover any information regarding Christopher. However, none could be obtained as Christopher hadn't shown up at work for over 10 days. Police speculated he might have been injured due to frequent trips outdoors alone. Search forces heated into nearby woods looking along routes Christopher had used. Specially trained dogs were deployed, yet no sign of Christopher was ever discovered. Terry suggested visiting Christopher's former apartment to ensure no accident had taken place, or perhaps find any traces that may give an idea as to his current whereabouts. Agreeing with her suggestion, investigators went directly to his former place of residence. They were shocked at what they found. Items scattered across the floor and closet doors open. Their initial thought was likely Christopher was just being disorganized. However, Terry quickly dismissed this theory, asserting he wasn't as messy. Detectives began to suspect that all these circumstances might be linked to Rand's disappearance. So, after inspecting her home, it was decided to expand their search efforts and locate him on an even wider scale. Police searched carefully through the neighborhood before eventually discovering Reagan's car outside the city limits, about eight miles from Iron River. Since it appeared unlikely, he left it there intentionally. One door needed to be broken open for entry into it. At first, there was nothing suspicious in the vehicle's interior. On its seats were ordinary clothes typically found among locals, a hat, coat, and gloves. But one of the policemen noticed something peculiar on the front passenger seat, a small piece of yellow paper bearing an illustrated map describing an itinerary for travel. No specific addresses were indicated, only an itinerary, so they decided to follow it closely. Terry explained to Christopher that despite living in Iron River for years, he still hadn't learned the names of streets and roads, so he wrote down directions like turning at a bus stop or passing gas stations as guides for navigation. Terry noted that Christopher had indicated in his notes that this was his first trip to this location. Terry and her colleagues followed the route indicated on a piece of paper and stopped in front of a house listed in Christopher's notes before heading toward their final destination in a neighboring town. Investigators knocked on the door, 
they needed to establish who lived there and why Christopher had traveled this way. Jason Cochran was surprised when uniformed men appeared outside his home. Shortly afterward, his wife Kelly appeared, and they were informed by officers of Christopher Reagan's disappearance that his abandoned car contained a piece of paper that pointed toward this address as part of their investigation. Kelly candidly revealed that she and Christopher worked at the same plant and were close. Although they hadn't spoken since mid-April, Kelly did manage to reconnect with Christopher in mid-June. Kelly Cran attempted to reach Chris via text messages between September and October, but received no reply. She assumed he had moved to North Carolina in search of employment, or possibly due to health concerns. Kelly also mentioned Christopher was having health problems and may have decided to start over somewhere new. When investigators found an address written down on a piece of paper found in Christopher's car, they became confused. Nonetheless, the couple remained willing to cooperate in any investigations that came their way. After brief questioning at Christopher's home without finding what they needed, detectives decided to head out. Their next phase involved speaking with Christopher's co-workers at work before proceeding to interview workers and supervisors at his factory. One supervisor made mention of an affair between Christopher and Kelly Cochran, a rumor circulating among workers. After hearing this claim, investigators decided to re-interview both parties involved so as to gain clarity as to their true natures and establish exactly what had transpired between them. Kelly ultimately acknowledged her affair with Christopher but could not tell him due to Jason being present. According to Kelly, their open relationship was fine with Jason being aware of any such affairs on the side. However, discussing such sensitive topics might hurt his feelings and be painful for both parties involved. Christopher's co-workers refuted Kelly's statements claiming Jason approved of their affair or there being any loose connections among their family as she claimed. Jason followed Kelly into the police office and their conversation revealed his opposition to Kelly's infidelity vehemently, thus making him an obvious suspect. However, due to a lack of evidence linking Jason with Christopher's disappearance, it became impossible for officers to conclude anything conclusively against Jason or Kelly. They had no choice but to release both from detention. The investigation continued for five months without yielding any clear resolution of its mystery. On March 5, 2015, Hobart Police Department Detective Jeremy Ogden took on the case immediately and began actively working it. Ogden began by conducting a comprehensive analysis of Kelly Cochran and Jason Cochran's history, meeting in high school before moving in together post-graduation. Their personalities couldn't have been any more different. Kelly was open and loved talking, while Jason preferred listening more than starting conversations first. Despite these differences, Jason and Kelly decided to marry. Following their wedding, the two started their own company providing swimming pool maintenance services. It was modest, but provided them with a decent income. Most of Jason's pool maintenance duties fell upon his shoulders until overwork and strain took its toll. Jason began experiencing back problems and felt heavier every day. Eventually, Kelly took over running the business. When it became clear he couldn't continue running it himself, Though this period proved challenging, she remained hopeful that Jason would soon recover and resume his duties once more. Kelly searched for ways to help Jason recover since medical drugs weren't providing enough relief. One day she learned of a plant that offered hope for Jason's recovery. Unfortunately, its use in medical practice hadn't started yet and wasn't available everywhere they lived. It had even been banned in their state. To get this drug, they moved from Florida to Michigan's Iron River Township. Jason could visit his doctor and receive his prescription for this miracle plant. Suddenly, his agony would finally end. Early in 2014, a plant that specializes in manufacturing parts for U.S. warships hired 34-year-old Kelly Cochran, who had moved with her husband Jason. Kelly made every effort to secure financial well-being for herself and Jason. Therefore, they accepted employment at Christopher Reagan's plant, where Kelly also worked. Over time, Christopher and Kelly discovered commonalities of conversation that helped foster their friendship. This proved particularly vital, as Christopher had recently experienced difficulty with Terry in his relationship. After reviewing all available evidence, the prosecutor made a strong argument to a judge in Michigan in support of obtaining a search warrant for Cochran's residence. After successfully receiving a ruling from the judge on March 5th, she sent investigators straight away on March 6th to locate Cochran's address. 
Searches were carried out of the Cochrane home with extreme care, looking for any signs that Kelly and Jason may have played any part in Christopher's disappearance. Unfortunately, all efforts proved futile. The only significant discovery was a book written by Jason under a pseudonym from video gaming culture. Although its title may cause amusement, its content was truly disturbing. Jason detailed horrific murder scenes of everyone who had wronged him. One character matched up perfectly with Christopher as they read through this dark and violent work. Suspicion increased surrounding Jason. Perhaps his crimes weren't made up, but instead stemmed from actual incidents he had committed himself. With these concerns in mind, investigators decided three weeks later to conduct another search of the Cochrane house, hoping to unearth the evidence missed during their previous search. When police officers drove up to their home, they noticed no vehicles present and that both the yard and driveway were empty as no answer came when knocking at their door. No one answered the door when knocked. As soon as Kelly and Jason had left town after the initial search, they moved quickly into Indiana, prompting investigators to become concerned they might never find evidence they needed for months, especially DNA samples of suspects like Jason Cochran. Michigan police officers reached out to their Indiana counterparts, asking them to collect samples instead, prompting Indiana officers to head toward Cochran's new address to take DNA samples instead. Ready to assist their Michigan colleagues, Indiana officers then traveled directly to Cochran's new address where DNA samples would be taken before heading directly toward Jason, Cochran's new address. The couple didn't object, seeing no legitimate basis to charge them with murder, nor evidence of Christopher Reagan. Meanwhile, investigation gradually disbanded, leaving little hope of solving his disappearance. Time passed until, on February 22, 2016, an alarming phone call arrived at Hobart Police Station from Kelly Cochran, who was clearly distressed over what had transpired. She attempted to explain that Jason wasn't breathing, but her emotions rendered it impossible for her to provide concrete details. Rescuers arrived quickly on the scene where Kelly attempted to prevent doctors from treating Jason due to her extreme terror and panic. Soon enough, however, it became evident that Jason no longer required assistance. Sitting in a chair, with his face lit up like it had been from extreme overheating, doctors were forced to confirm his death and send his body for forensic examination, while Kelly was handed over to a police patrol who took her back home with relatives living nearby on her street. Investigators were determined to ascertain what had transpired, so they conducted a search of Cochrane's new home and discovered evidence in the form of a syringe needle at the foot of the marital bed. After inspecting Jason's body, an investigator concluded that his death was due to illegal drug abuse. However, this report came as a shock for detectives. Jason had an excessive amount of illegal substances in his system. However, the results from forensic tests indicated something more disturbing. His death had been caused by strangulation as evidenced by bruises on his neck and face. So Jason, who had been suspected of kidnapping Christopher Rian himself, became himself the victim of crime. This revelation raised new questions and necessitated a thorough re-examination of evidence. Immediately thereafter, forensic specialists turned their focus onto Kelly Cochran, whom many suspected as being linked to both incidents. She became suspect not only for Christopher's disappearance, but also in her husband's murder. The investigation became even more complex. On February 23, 2016, Kelly Cochran was summoned to testify in Jason's murder case at the police station. Investigators directly interrogated her about her possible involvement in his death and whether she administered excessive doses of illegal drugs to him. Regardless of the lack of concrete evidence and pressure from investigators, this young woman did not confess to either the murder of Jason or the kidnapping of Christopher. Investigators were unable to find sufficient proof of Kelly's guilt and were unable to arrest him, leading Detective Jeremy Ogden on a trail that eventually brought him face to face with Walter Hammerman, one of Jason's closest allies. During this investigation process, Detective Ogden met up with Walter Hammerman. Walter immediately ran to the police upon hearing of Kelly's shocking story of Jason's tragic death from illegal drugs, emphasizing how close they were. Walter assured his partner that any changes would certainly have been communicated. 
Jason had been taking medicinal herbs with the sole aim of relieving his back pain for quite some time now, yet Walter noticed his friend had fallen into an unstable situation recently. In March last year, Jason revealed his concerns with him regarding travel arrangements to Indiana due to Iron River police involvement in a disappearance case. All this had had a lasting impactful impression upon Jason. Walter witnessed Kelly become severely depressed and attempted suicide, necessitating medical intervention and therapy. Walter noticed a distinct change in Kelly's behavior as he took more control over his life. Jason seemed on edge, while in the past, the boys could spend hours playing video games together. Now he would avoid parties whenever his wife returned from work. This information became crucial in understanding what was transpiring within the Cochran family. After learning that Jason had died by strangulation, Detective Ogden devised an intricate plan to force Kelly Cochran to reveal the truth regarding Christopher Rian's fate. Walter, Jason's close companion and close ally, was chosen as bait, intended to lure Kelly into an incriminating trap and cause her to make mistakes that could potentially compromise Christopher Rean. Walter accepted a difficult role within this investigation while playing out this performance before Kelly Cochran. On March 12, 2016, Walter called Kelly while under surveillance by police officers with listening devices, intending to present her with a letter purporting to come from Jason that contained something important and urgent. Walter explained to Kelly that Jason gave this letter shortly before his death with instructions not to open it and send it immediately to police should anything occur. This came as quite a shock, both to Walter and to those watching over their situation. Yet even with this development, detectives had no direct evidence against her husband's killing. Investigators conducted numerous interrogation sessions with Kelly in an attempt to extract the truth. She denied her guilt throughout. On April 26, 2016, however, it became evident that Kelly Cochran had managed to slip away from their scrutiny. It seemed a mockery of justice, and detectives immediately joined forces with police officers from Iron River and Hobart in launching a federal manhunt against Kelly Cochran. Walter Hammerman was both shocked and alarmed that Kelly hadn't yet been apprehended. He worried she may get away with this crime once more and later attack him in return. Her phone had also been disconnected as though she were playing a cat and mouse game with the police. Detective Jeremy Ogden managed to piece together, after two long and hectic days of trying, that Kelly Cochran had managed to avoid detection by fleeing to Kentucky's Wingo Town, more than six hours away from Hobart. On April 28th, Kelly was located at her cousin's house by police officers who issued the same warning. As soon as they received this information, an arrest team quickly proceeded to the house, knowing Kelly could be dangerous and likely attempt to flee. They moved swiftly without warning, and Kelly was apprehended and taken into custody that afternoon. Later that same evening, Detective Ogden arrived in Wingo, where he resumed interviews with suspect, alongside investigators from Indiana and Michigan. Once I spoke with Kelly Cochran, everything became crystal clear. Christopher Rian and Kelly's relationship went deeper and further than anyone imagined. Kelly truly loved him and dreamed of leaving this cursed city together and starting a new life together. But everything changed on October 13, 2015 when Jason learned about her cheating. They began fighting, and Jason remembered their wedding night pact whereby anyone found out cheating would be required to kill their partner as punishment. Kelly asserted that she never intended to take their agreement seriously. It had always seemed more like a joke to her. Jason warned Kelly if she didn't keep her vow, threatening that he would carry it out himself if necessary. Although Kelly didn't wish for this responsibility, she nevertheless helped Jason commit a horrifying crime. On October 14, 2015, Christopher Rian traveled to Kelly Cochran's house, hoping to take full advantage of their first meeting. Rian wanted every moment to count, their encounter, and every memory he would create together with Cochran. Kelly took full advantage of his absence from home to offer him dinner and an intimate time together. All plans went according to plan. Their evening promised to be memorable. After dining together on the first floor of Kelly's house, according to Kelly, they moved up onto the second. But their solitude was abruptly interrupted when Jason burst in with a rifle in hand, panicked and terrified. 
Christopher quickly recognized he was trapped, while Jason took aim and fired one shot directly at Christopher's head without delay. Chris was mortally wounded by Jason's bullet and died instantly. Following this event, Jason instructed his accomplices to bring Christopher's body down into the basement where they dismembered it with a hacksaw. Eventually, all his limbs and head had been severed from its torso. The perpetrators then placed Christopher's remains into several trash bags before disposing of them by dumping them in the woods near Crystal Falls Village. Christopher's car was moved away to avoid suspicion while they thoroughly cleaned Christopher's house to erase evidence of crime. They had become accomplices in an awful crime. Kelly Cochran was open about her involvement in Jason Cochran's tragic death, saying the plan to commit the act came about after learning of Kelly having had an affair and Jason becoming jealous that Kelly had chosen someone else as his partner. According to Cochran, this idea of revenge came when Jason learned of Kelly having another lover and decided on taking drastic measures against Kelly in revenge for what had transpired between them. Kelly wanted revenge against Christopher for taking away their happiness together and feeling betrayed by Kelly's spouse. Kelly revealed how deeply in love with Christopher she was and felt that his absence had prevented them from living life fully. Kelly struggled to cope with both her loss and its accompanying pain on a daily basis. Kelly loathed Jason for forcing her into doing what he forced her into, realizing she couldn't continue living peacefully with it. An opportunity presented itself when Jason complained of backache on February 22, 2016. Kelly decided it would be time for action against Jason. Kelly convinced Jason to give her an overdose of medication. Unfortunately, however, its effects weren't instantaneous and Kelly covered his mouth and nose with her hands to ensure suffocation occurred before squeezing his neck to make sure Jason was dead, thus leading to bruised body parts on him. Kelly Cochran provided testimony that assisted law enforcement authorities to identify where Christopher's remains were buried. On May 18, 2016, Detective Jeremy Ogden, along with investigators and canine team, went to a site near Crystal Falls Village. This rarely visited neighborhood had become the site of an astonishing mystery. A team of investigators set off a thorough search around Lake Erie's surrounding woods, penetrating between trees to ensure no spots had been missed. One of their canine dogs suddenly sensed an odor and led the officers toward it. Officers were following the dog closely, expecting to discover something soon. Instead, it led them to an unassuming hill covered with fallen leaves and branches. Upon clearing this area, investigators found objects including what looked to be human remains, unmistakably identifiable skulls. On closer examination, it was evident that Christopher Reagan had been murdered. A bullet hole attested to this. Investigators knew they had found Christopher's severed head. Additionally, there was evidence such as a 22 caliber bullet and broken gun found at the scene, as well as glasses belonging to Reagan that may have belonged to her. Dental records helped identify his remains, solving an investigation that had perplexed investigators for two years. Kelly Cochran was officially charged with murdering Christopher Rian and Jason Cochran in April 2016. On February 13, 2017, Michigan State Court officially arraigned this 34-year-old individual in Michigan State Court. The prosecutor noted Kelly was significantly reduced her role by being behind both crimes. Christopher only saw Kelly as a casual companion. Kelly, however, genuinely loved Christopher and planned for their future together. Christopher's refusal of her romantic advances resulted in fury and Kelly decided to kill him by fabricating a story of an alliance between herself and Christopher's brother-in-law. Kelly confessed in court, yet presented another version. As per her allegations, she had been subject to abuse at the hands of her jealous husband, who orchestrated this act of violence. On November 9th, he hid in their basement and caught their lovers off guard before seizing an opportunity and using it as an excuse to grab a weapon in a fit of anger and shoot Christopher. Jason suggested dismembering Christopher Rian's body, and Kelly agreed by being threatened to kill Jason Cochran. When presented with this new version of events, however, the jury began questioning Kelly's guilt. After three hours of deliberation, they reached their verdict of premeditated murder of Christopher Rian 
resulting in life imprisonment without parole for Kelly and 65 years for Cochran. Kelly Cochran was taken directly from the courtroom and sent directly to Crown Point Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where she is serving her sentence with only regrets regarding her personal life. Kelly stated in one phone interview, I tried my best at doing what was expected, from school through college and marriage, but ultimately all my efforts went in vain. All I ever did was work while my husband entertained himself with computer games. At prison, Kelly Cochran continues to reveal details of her crimes and claims she and Jason committed additional offenses. Christopher was just one of their many victims. Unfortunately, due to Kelly not disclosing additional crimes committed or victims she claims existed at this point in time, it's difficult for anyone to corroborate Kelly's statements. Her brother heard from Kelly that there may have been others, yet there is no concrete proof to back that up yet. Detective Jeremy Ogden from Hobart, Indiana Police Department is carefully scrutinizing every aspect in hope of uncovering clues or uncovering evidence pointing towards any additional crimes committed by either of Kelly or Jason Cochran. Hopefully, it can close another chapter in this twisted tale. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. 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 Samantha Fraser's case shows that a monster can't be re-educated, not even by a trained and experienced psychologist. When someone shows signs of being cruel, they should be left alone right away. People like that don't change, so they don't deserve a second chance. They are capable of the worst crimes and think they can get away with them. The terrible events took place in the summer of 2018 on Phillip, a quiet island in Australia close to Melbourne. But let's read the story in the right order. Adrian Basham was born in 1973 in Australia, where he grew up. The boy grew up in a family with a police officer. While he didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of the police in his early years, many people now believe that his cruel and violent attacks are linked to his family and childhood. When Adrian's father, James Basham, found out that his son had killed someone badly, he did not only not condemn him, but based on his experience as a police officer, he told him how to act to try to avoid getting in trouble. Samantha Fraser was born in the suburbs of Melbourne in the summer of 1980. Her parents, Janine and Travis Fraser, were friendly and loving, and they did everything they could to help their only daughter. They worked hard to help her learn and show off her skills. Samantha worked hard in school and played sports, and she consistently won awards for her outstanding performance. The girl then went to a well-known university and graduated with a red diploma from the psychology department. She kept doing sports like acrobatics, gymnastics, and dancing while she was in school, which helped her lead the student cheerleading team. After going to college, Samantha got a job as a psychotherapist at a large medical facility. Her co-workers and patients quickly came to respect and trust her. Samantha really loved what she was doing, and this job was her calling. Sam and Adrian met for the first time in late 2005. First, they were just friends, but soon, things turned romantic between them. Friends and family of this couple didn't understand what the two young people, who were so different in every way, had in common. Samantha was friendly, open, and nice, and she could always solve a problem in a peaceful way. Adrian, on the other hand, was very rude and harsh when he talked to people. He was also very angry and hostile, in spite of this, the couple made their relationship official a year and a half after they met. They bought a house in the suburbs of Melbourne, not far from where Samantha's parents live. Not long after, the man got a job with a big company that worked to develop mineral deposits. Because his job required him to go on business trips all the time, he wasn't at home very often. There's no doubt that this is why he and Samantha stayed married for so long. Adrian became a real tyrant at home and tried to control his wife in every way. He not only expected people to obey him without question, but he also did some strange things that might have been signs of a mental disorder. For instance, he insisted crazily that the house was always in perfect order, and this included both how clean it was and where everything was. It's small things like where the books are on the shelf or where the toiletries are in the bathroom. 
Any change could make him angry and violent right away. Samantha was a psychologist, so she knew how to make things better between people who were fighting. She hoped that her husband would change over time and become more calm and consistent. Along with that, they had three children together. Two daughters, Jemima and April, and a son, Rex. But Adrian's character didn't change even when heirs showed up. In 2014, family problems led to physical abuse in another case. She then didn't say anything, didn't call the police, and didn't tell anyone what happened. People she cared about and her co-workers had no idea that her husband had put his hand on her. She was naive enough to think that this would not happen again. After a year though, the same thing happened again. Adrian hit his wife. Samantha chose that this time it was the last straw. Samantha was also going crazy because her husband was throwing temper tantrums all the time and wanted to control her every move. She told the police in writing that her husband had beaten her and then she took the kids and moved in with her parents. They got a divorce in the spring of 2017 and Samantha and their kids were given the family home by the court. They soon went back there. But Adrian had no plans to leave his ex-wife alone. He kept after her, making her life miserable. The young woman was always afraid for her life and the lives of her children because she didn't feel safe. She went to court and got an order that her ex-husband couldn't talk to them or try to get involved in their business in any way. But that didn't stop Basham. He stayed nearby and did everything he could to bother Samantha. At least one of Adrian's friends said that he promised to take away from his ex-wife everything she cares about, from the house to the kids. He also openly threatened to hurt her physically. The man told his friend again not long before the tragedy that Samantha would soon pay for everything. He also seemed dangerous, but the friend didn't take what he said seriously until he heard that the woman had died. Because Samantha was always scared and tense, she put bars on her windows, put an alarm system in her house, and put surveillance cameras outside her house. The woman told him that she was scared that her ex-husband would break into her house and hurt her or the kids. Samantha started to think that her ex-husband had calmed down a bit about a year after they got divorced. He disappeared from her view less often, which made her feel safer. Samantha even started an affair and made plans for a better, happier life. For Fraser's 38th birthday on July 22, 2018, she spent the day with close friends and a man she loves named Wayne. People who spent the holiday with her remember that she looked happy and in good spirits for herself and her family. A few days before the wedding, the man had proposed to the woman. After the wedding, they were going to take a long vacation and travel to forget about their problems. Samantha had already taken her kids to school the next morning and was on her way to work when she got a call from a friend telling her that Adrian was nearby. Samantha was worried about this, but she chose not to freak out and instead decided to be more careful. Her ex-husband was due to appear in court in a couple of weeks on charges of domestic violence. She was afraid that he would hurt her in some way because of the lawsuit. The woman told her best friend about her worries over the phone, but her friend reassured her. Samantha was never seen alive again after that talk. Samantha wasn't there to pick up her kids from school that day. So the teacher, who knew that things were tough in Samantha's family, called the police. The police went to their house right away to check on everything. At first, it looked like the mistress hadn't come back yet. But when the police of... The police chose to check the garage next to the house, which showed a very bad picture. The homeowner, who was 38 years old, was found dead hanging from the garage door chain. In general, the picture might have made it look like the young woman had killed herself, but Samantha looked like she had been hit by a truck. Samantha had not a single living thing on her and the hair on her head was wet and falling over her face. She wasn't wearing the clothes she had on when she left the house in the morning and she didn't have any shoes on. It was clear that someone else had been in the garage and they had tried to make it look like Samantha had died on her own. It did a lot of wrong things though, say a broken down stepladder was lying next to the body but the rope was so long that the woman's feet were touching the ground. Samantha had deep bruises under her eyes and on her temple. She had scrapes and hematomas all over her body from falling down and hitting things. The forensic medical examination later showed that the deceased had a serious head injury 
which means that she was either already unconscious or dead when she was hanged. Experts in forensics found blood and epithelial particles under the victim's fingernails. This means that she desperately fought back and scratched her abuser. A lot of blood and small splatters of blood had been washed up on the floor, walls, and body of the car in the garage. In later tests, blood was also found on the rope that the body was hanging from in several places. Adrian Basham rode his motorcycle to his dad James's house in the evening of the same day. He looked stressed, and there were new scratches on his face. When his father asked him about it, he dodged the question, and when asked about the cuts, he said that he got them from riding his motorcycle without a helmet and scratching himself with tree branches. Then he got a big pack of wet wipes and began wiping down his car, saying that he wanted to get rid of the gnats that had stuck to it during the ride. As a former police officer, his dad knew right away that something wasn't right, and his professional instincts were right. When police came to James's door the next day with questions about his son and said he was the main suspect in the murder of his ex-wife, James knew what was going on. In the beginning, Basham Sr. said that he had not seen his son. To buy some time, he then told the heir what he should say and do in order to, if not get out of jail, at least get less time. Adrian did what his father told him to do and listened quietly as the charges were read to him. He then went to the station with the help of the lawyers his father had already hired. At first, Adrian flatly refused to help with the investigation. He didn't say he wasn't guilty. He just didn't say anything and ignored all the questions. Still, the evidence that was gathered was enough. The investigators saw that the man had fresh scratches on his face and thought that Samantha had scratched him to protect herself. Blood and epithelial particles were found under her nails. There were also sweat marks on the rope that his ex-wife's body was hanging from. When Adrian's motorcycle was looked at, washed up blood from the dead person was found on it. A bloody woman's blouse was also found in a trash can outside his dad's house. It looks like he tried to get rid of that proof but didn't have time. Samantha put up cameras outside her house not long before the terrible event, and they caught a man leaving the crime scene quickly on the day of the murder. There was no doubt that it was Adrian, even though his face was hidden by a hood pulled over his baseball cap. Piece by piece, the events of the victim's last day were put back together, and the picture that was made was shockingly violent. Basham broke the lock on the garage door while no one was home and went inside. He waited for his ex-wife to come home for several hours. She didn't know it, but Samantha drove into Adrian's garage and he attacked her before she could get out. The scratches on the attacker's face show how hard Fraser tried to fight back, but the two sides were not equal. He beat the woman until she passed out. To hide his tracks, he took off her bloody blouse and put on a black t-shirt he found in the house. He then poured water over her head to clean the blood out of her blonde hair. He then hung his ex-wife from the garage door with a rope around her neck. He put a stepladder on the floor next to the body just to be sure, but he didn't figure out how long the rope was. Adrian cleaned up the blood spots, but he didn't get the small splatters that were all over the place. This blows my mind. A young mother of three who was loved by all was found dead in her own garage. Killer tried to make it look like the person died of their own free will, but there were many signs that it wasn't true. Samantha's body was also in a state that showed she had accepted martyrdom. The worst part was that the victim had been living with this man for a long time, put up with his emotional and physical abuse, and raised his children while hoping that he would change. Adrian changed his plan when he realized that neither denying nor staying quiet would help because all the evidence pointed to him. Basham said that he was at his ex-wife's house that day, but he only wanted to talk to her and persuade her to drop her domestic violence lawsuit. People say that the conversation went badly and that fists were used, but he said he left afterward and Frazier was awake and aware at the time. Lawyers for the defendant insisted that their client was only guilty of battery and that Samantha turned her life over after that. But Samantha's family says she would never do that and did not leave her kids. She also had big plans for her life and was going to get married again soon. The murder case didn't start until the end of 2022. Older children of the divorced parents went to the sessions and spoke out against their father and asked for a fair punishment. 
The youngest son didn't show up to court. He chose not to subject himself to unnecessary stress. Besides that, the boy was scared and panicked about his father. And the defense tried to show that the defendant did what he did because he was feeling bad. But this didn't work because Adrian planned the crime, waited several hours for his victim, and tried to get rid of evidence. The court didn't give its final decision on this case until February 2023. Adrian was found guilty of beating someone to death on purpose and given a life sentence without the chance of parole for at least 30 years. The children of Travis and Samantha Fraser were given to Jeanine and Travis Fraser as guardians. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Cape Town is 400 miles away from the city of Port Elizabeth, which is at the western end of Algoa Bay, on the southeast coast of South Africa. This city is a major seaport and also has the sixth most people in South Africa. When Chris Panayotu, then 18 years old, graduated from high school in this city in November 2004, he went to work for his dad's trading company. In the city and the areas around it, his father owned a large chain of stores and restaurants. Chris had always wanted to work in his dad's business, even when he was young. He was also very interested in running retail chains and growing the retail services industry. He was very active and determined, and his goals went far beyond being an executive and skilled worker under his father's supervision. Chris wanted to open his own fish restaurant near a five-star hotel on Marina Drive and a big grocery store close to Kings Beach downtown. While Chris was helping his dad at a small diner on Market Street in the afternoon, he ran into an old high school friend. The friend invited Chris to a party on Friday night at Barney's Tavern, a popular beach spot for young people. Chris saw a pretty young girl drinking lemonade from a tall glass while sitting alone at the bar in a wicker bamboo chair and drinking beer from the establishment's specialty mug. Chris got up from his seat and went to meet her. She was 18 years old and her name was Jade Dinks. They hit it off right away and they quickly found that they had a lot in common. Chris and Jade started dating after that party. They had no idea that their meeting at Barney's Tavern on Friday night would be the start of a terrible love triangle story that ended in tragedy. The girl named Jade was always happy and friendly and she wanted to make other people feel good. Because she wanted to make a difference, she decided to become a teacher and started college in 2005. While Jade worked on her schoolwork, Chris started his own business. He started with a grocery store and then opened Infinite, a restaurant and bar in the neighborhood. Even though both Jade and Chris had a lot going on in their lives, their relationship grew stronger, like the roots of a young tree going deeper into the ground. They each made their own happy place where love and kindness seemed to last forever and where days were full of smiles and hope for a bright future. Things started to go wrong in their relationship over time, mostly because Chris was seeing another woman. At first, Chanel Cooties was just working at the store that Chris owned and their relationship was strictly business. But as time went on, their interactions turned into a secret love affair that they tried to hide with mysterious smiles and small movements. They met in secret in hotels in the area and Chris even let Chanel stay with him while Jade was away. Chris and Jade seemed like a happy and successful young couple to their family and friends, especially after they got engaged and then married in 2012. Jade finished college and got a job at an elementary school, and Chris's business looked like it was doing well. However, Chris's relationship with Chanel continued, which made things difficult in their marriage. When Costa Panayotu, Chris's father, found out that his son was having an affair with a sales clerk, he was very upset and angry. He couldn't understand how Chris, who had been seeing Jade for eight years and knew she was smart, kind, and moral, could act so badly. Costa confronted Chris at Infinite while he was celebrating his engagement with friends, which turned into a heated argument. Costa told Chris that he would lose his inheritance if he kept seeing Chanel. Chris told his father that he was ending his relationship with Chanel, but they were still seeing each other behind his back. During this time, Jade didn't know that her fiancé was cheating on her. Chris's finances got worse as he tried to balance his two different lives. 
He spent a lot of money on gifts for Chanel, fancy hotel rooms, and other unnecessary things. While Chris was away from Jade more and more over the next three years, it hurt his business and his family. Jade started to feel more and more alone and ignored in her marriage. She told her friends how upset she was and how she had tried but failed to get them back to getting along. In September 2014, Jade was at the point of losing her mind. She wrote a very emotional letter on September 21st about how much she wanted love, a normal marriage, and a caring partner. She also told him how annoyed she was with Chris's secrecy and the distrust and uncertainty it caused. Three big men in a rented car pulled up to the gate of Staringglad Village on April 20th, 2015, in the early morning. This is where the young Panayotu couple lived. They saw a young woman who was well-dressed and impatiently waiting by the road. Two of the men got out of the car, but the driver told them to stay inside. A black BMW pulled up next to her and they watched. When she got in the car, it took off quickly, making the people who wanted to take her hostage angry. Like every other day, Jade left her house at 6.15 a.m., waiting for her friend and co-worker Cheryl to pick her up in her BMW for their daily trip to work. Cheryl was running a little behind, and she saw the car from the day before with tinted windows at the curb. When Jade reached for her phone to call Cheryl, she saw two people coming from the bushes next to the road. Cheryl was only 10 minutes late, but Jade wasn't there. Cheryl tried to call Jade's cell phone and knock on her door, but got no answer. Cheryl finally called the police and by 10 a.m., Jade Panayotu was officially reported missing. This led to a large-scale search that included police, a K-9 unit, and volunteers from the community. The search for Jade went on, but on the first day, nothing was found. The search started up again the next morning, and there was a reward for anyone who could help find her. Around 10 a.m., Angel, a K-9 officer, found Jade's dead body in a bushy ravine close to Quano Bushley. Even though she was fully dressed, a medical exam showed that she had been shot three times in the back and fatally in the head. Her jewelry and bank cards were missing, making it look like the people who killed her were trying to hide why they did it. Jade's family and friends were shocked and couldn't understand what had happened. Her co-workers and students were also very sad. The news of her death spread all over the city and people were sad and confused on social media. On October 22nd, Jade's family held a memorial service at a Catholic church. This was followed by a funeral that was attended by a huge number of people from Port Elizabeth. People who knew and loved Jade were deeply saddened by her death. South African police service officers were also at the city cemetery. They thought Chris Panayotu's behavior during the funeral was strange and staged. As suspicions grew, the court later found that Chris's farewell speech looked a lot like a dedication on the internet by Charles Atkins to his late wife. Even though it wasn't direct proof, this discovery made people think that Chris may have been involved in killing his wife. The authorities decided to keep a close eye on him. Several other strange events also pointed to Chris's involvement in the murder of his wife. Luthando Sioni, a security guard at Chris's nightclub, was arrested by the police the night before the funeral because they thought he might have worked with the killer. Luthando said Chris had asked him to hire killers for his wife and that Chris had already found three friends to carry out the plan. There was proof that someone tried to use Jade's bank cards on the day she was killed and surveillance footage showed two men that Luthando identified as the hired killers. As a reward for his help, the police let Luthando go on the condition that he gather more evidence, including Chris's confession to killing his wife. Because he was told to, Luthando called Chris for a private conversation that was recorded. During the conversation, Chris said something that led to his arrest. After that, three more suspects were caught and the crime's details were put back together. Hit men were sent by Chris to kill Jade Panayotu in the early hours of April 20th, 2015. But because of an unplanned change in her plans, the execution was moved to the next day. On April 21st, Jade was taken hostage and taken to a remote area and brutally killed. The thieves took her valuables and ran away. They tried to take money out of her bank cards but couldn't because the PN they were using was wrong. The trial against Chris and the two mercenaries began on October 11, 2015, 
and was widely watched and reported on by the media. The prosecution said that Chris killed one of the women because he was having money problems that were made worse by his double life and his desire to kill one of the women. At the trial, different types of evidence were shown, such as Chanel Coutis's testimony, call logs, ATM videos, and photos. Along with the two hired killers, Chris was found guilty by the court and given a life sentence. On December 9, 2019, Chris's father, Costa Panayotu, died in a mysterious accident. This added another sad turn to the story. This made the story even more complicated and left a lot of questions unanswered. If Chris had anything to do with his father's death, it made an already scary story even scarier. Overall, Chris Panayotu's actions showed how far some people are willing to go to put their own needs ahead of the lives and well-being of those they care about. People are angry and upset about what he did, which led to the brutal murder of his wife Jade. It's still not clear if Chris had anything to do with his father's death, but he is now facing the consequences of his horrible crimes, which means he will never get away. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. When we think about what makes a place great to live, we often think about how safe it is, how nice the neighborhood is, and how friendly the people who live there are. One country meets all of the requirements. Iceland is an island nation off the east coast of Greenland that has been voted one of the best places to live in the world over and over again. Just over 340,000 people live there, making it one of the world's smallest cities. But its stunning natural beauty makes up for it in a big way. People come from all over the world to see the natural springs and rolling hills. People from all over the world come to this small country to see its many attractions, such as its beautiful architecture and the Aurora Borealis. Because Iceland has harsh winters, there isn't always a lot of sunlight but that just adds to the mystery of the place, which is so different from what most of us know and understand. One of the most appealing things about Iceland is the friendliness, openness, and kindness of its people. Due to the tough terrain and harsh winters, people rely on each other, value community, and take care of their neighbors. There are strong social attitudes against crime. They have no army, and their police officers do not carry guns. People often leave their doors unlocked and get lifts with strangers. The peace and quiet of Iceland would be broken one Friday night in 2017 by a brutal murder that seemed to have no reason. The country would be left in shock. We are going to talk about Birna Briansdottir. Birna Briansdottir lived in the southeast of Reykjavik. While her parents were no longer together, they remained on friendly terms and she was the center of their world. She was bright and spirited, with her fiery personality reflected in her striking auburn hair. She was incredibly witty with a sharp sense of humor, which made her popular among her friends. She was carefree and whimsical, but always responsible, with this maturity reflected in her relationship with her family and her mature attitude toward work. Music was a big passion, and Berna wasn't picky. She would listen to anything from rap to pop and from rock to folk. It was this openness and free spirit that made so many people love her. Brina had a close group of friends and liked going out at night in Reykjavik. She worked in the fashion section of a busy department store. To relax, she would get drinks at the local bar after work and then go out to really let her hair down. For sure, this is what Berna did that night, January 13th, 2017. After closing the shop, she got drinks, played a few rounds of cards, and then went to the center of the capital to laugh, drink, and dance all night. They went to Horror, a place where new bands would play, and Berna was soon dancing on the stage. While her friends were ready to leave by 2 a.m., Berna wasn't. She wanted to keep having fun. She left the club just before 5 a.m. and walked out into the nine-degree weather. She then went to get falafel and then walked back to her house. A woman walking alone in Reykjavik was not rare. People trusted each other and looked out for each other. Due to her intoxication, she dropped coins and stumbled into a stranger on the side of the road. As she carried on walking, she turned a corner and walked down a narrow lane towards the sea. Then she vanished. 
Because she was known for being on time when she didn't show up for work, people were worried right away. Maria, a school friend who worked with Berna, was upset right away that she wasn't there. Hmm. It got worse when she tried to call her cell phone. It wouldn't work and Berna never turned off her phone. People thought she had just gone back to her dad's house to sleep off her hangover. Her friends who had been out with her that night also thought this, but she wasn't there. Scylla, Berna's mother, was called because she was also worried about where her daughter was. She knew Berna and knew that this wasn't like her at all without waiting. Her family called the police right away to say she wasn't there. Realizing the power of social media, Scylla posted to her Facebook page, Dear friends, it's not like her that we can't reach her. Please share and let's find her, Scylla. Iceland is a small community, and before long, Scylla's desperate pleas on Facebook were being shared, and news of Berna's disappearance began to circulate. The stress and worry of having a child go missing are unimaginable. Her parents couldn't sleep, and they persistently made calls to all the emergency services, desperately seeking any new information on Berna's whereabouts. The following day, the police were able to trace her last known mobile interaction before it went dead or was turned off. Just before 6 a.m., her phone pinged off a mobile tower in a port town, Hafnerfjörder, six miles outside of the capital. Right away, Scylla got in her car and drove there calling out to her daughter and looking around the area. A group of family and friends worked with her to get Berna back home alive. Soon, 36 hours had passed since Birna had disappeared into the night in Reykjavik. Her friends and family were sure that something bad had happened to her. She was a trustworthy young woman, and this was not like her at all. Not much was known to the police, though. There was no proof of a murder or kidnapping, so they couldn't do much. As word of her disappearance spread, it quickly made the front page of every newspaper. Every newscaster in Iceland talked about Berna all the time. Her face was on every newspaper page. In the early hours of Sunday morning, her parents went to the police and begged them to search for her. They said she would not have gone off on her own accord, much less not told anyone where she was going. She had no money troubles or relationship problems. Everyone who knew Berna adored her. A case as baffling and unusual as this required Iceland's best detectives, one of which was Grim or Grimson. He had 30 years of investigative experience. He was even part of a special team who spent more than five years building a case against those whose misconduct and corruption contributed to the financial crash of 2009. After this, he returned to his roots as a police officer, saying he missed the fast-paced work. Like his colleagues, he too wasn't initially that concerned about Berna. There were many other factors that he had to consider. People do go missing in Iceland. Anything from mental health problems to simply staying at a friend's house and not telling people. Most missing people would eventually turn up. A lot of CCTV is set up in capital cities around the world, but Reykjavik isn't like most of them. The people of Iceland don't like being watched, and since crime isn't common, the people tend to police themselves. They watch out for each other and strangers, but someone saw her the night she went missing. CCTV showed her leaving the club with her coins in the ground and walking into a stranger. When Grimson checked the next camera less than a block away, she was gone. There were two options. Either she had gone down the side road off the corner or got into a car. Grimson paid close attention to the little things and he was sure that the broken CCTV footage held a clue that would lead them to Berna. The red Kaya Rio he saw was going the other way on the other side of the road from Berna. A short time after Berna had been seen at the Lebowski bar, he saw it drive by. The police had to follow up on this lead. What was next? They couldn't see the license plate, who was driving, or how many people were in the car. There were more than 100 of those kinds of cars in Iceland. This didn't make her parents feel better about their worries. Scylla was incandescent when they explained the quality of the tape was too poor to extract any more details from. Scylla said, can't you find it like in the movies? Grimson replied, it doesn't work like that. The police knew that even though they didn't have enough CCTV, the people in the area had hope. They asked the people of Iceland to help them at a rare press conference, 
Grimson and Berna's upset family spoke in front of the cameras and begged Iceland to help them find her. In front of the media, Scylla showed what kind of person her daughter was by saying that she was very smart, bilingual, loved other cultures, and loved to travel. The police's hunch at the press conference would lead to a breakthrough. It proved right, and before long, they had their first lead. A pair of brothers decided to search Hafnarfjörder, where her phone had pinged off the tower, and when there, they headed towards the harbor. After searching in a fenced-off area, they found a pair of boots, Black Doc Martens, identical to the pair that Berna had last been seen wearing. Using the power of social media, they posted a picture of them to Facebook, and before long, the officers arrived. They confirmed the shoes were Berna's. The police finally felt like they were making progress. Grimson told the police to carefully look through the CCTV footage, and soon they saw a picture they knew. At 6 a.m. on the morning Berna went missing, a red Kia Rio pulled into the harbor. A drunk man got out of the car and stumbled toward a fishing trawler that had already been docked. After that, the car drove off. Finally, they were able to read the license plate. The car had been rented by Thomas Muller Olson, a 25-year-old fisherman from Greenland. A family had since rented the car and said there was a smell of chemicals coming from the back. After taking the car away, police were determined to find any sign of Berna. Eventually, they found a clue. There were blood spots in the back seat. So that they could find out if it was Berna, samples were quickly taken and sent to Sweden to be analyzed. For Grimson and his team, it was now a race against time. They needed to find the trawler and their only suspects, Thomas Miller Olson and Nikolai Olson. Thomas and Nikolai weren't related, but were crewmates on the trawler. Thomas was considered easygoing, approachable, and generally likable while on board. His phone pinged, and Thomas went pale. It was a news article saying that the ship he was on was linked to the disappearance of Berna. A journalist had contacted a Facebook group used by the men on board and asked who had rented the car and who was seen on the CCTV. Thomas was visibly shaken. His captain assured him if he was innocent, he would be fine. There was a huge challenge for Grimson and his team. The longer his suspects were on that boat, the longer they had to make up stories and get rid of anything that could be used against them. Not to worry, the ship's captain already had a plan. He read about the connection between the ship and Berna, so he turned the ship around and went back to Iceland. He and his top officers agreed that they would say the engine problems made them have to turn around, and the suspects couldn't read anything about the case because the Wi-Fi was turned off. In order to catch them off guard, the police sent members of their elite counter-terrorism squad, also known as the Viking Squad, to board the ship as soon as it arrived back in Iceland. Finally, the police were able to catch their two suspects after dropping officers off from a helicopter on the ship. The reaction of the public to the case was massive, and the whole country was waiting on tenterhooks for any news of what had happened to Berna. The case seemed to take over all aspects of Icelandic life. Although their intentions were good, online sleuths only added to the confusion and it became hard to distinguish rumor from fact. Stories ranged from a body being found in a lake to Berna and other women being found alive on the trawler swirled around social media. Grimson stayed calm and asked everyone else to do the same. People who meant well, though, were not helping the search for Berna. Around 11 p.m. on Wednesday, the ship came back into port and the two suspects were handcuffed and brought back to Iceland. Then the terrible news came out. Berna's blood was found in the rental car. It didn't take the police long to question the two men. Nikolaj and Thomas were sure they hadn't hurt Berna and they both told the same story about what happened that terrible night. They had split up and gone to different bars to drink before getting back together as the night was coming to a close. Nikolai was already very drunk, so it was hard for him to remember what they said. He had no idea who they were, but they said they had picked up two girls on the street, and one of them was Berna. Thomas said he left Nikolai at the ship and then drove off. Then he went to the back with the two girls and let them kiss. After an hour, he dropped them off. The police were inclined to believe Nikolai, 
He had been seen walking away and was clearly in no fit state to do anything. However, when it came to Thomas, they had a bad feeling and the evidence against him was stacking up. He was examined by a doctor who determined that the wounds on his chest were signs of a struggle or fight. When searching the ship, the police found a driver's license in the bin. It belonged to Berna. They also found drugs with a street value of nearly one and a half million pounds. Thomas claimed to have slept in the car, but the police checked the odometer, which showed that the car had been taken for a long drive. They also had CCTV on his person because he was seen buying plastic bags and cleaning fluid before cleaning the inside of the car. The police didn't believe his story that he was sick and just trying to clean the car because they knew the blood spots were Berna's. The back of the car lit up when they used luminol to bring out any blood that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. This showed that it was completely covered in blood. Four days after she vanished, Iceland launched the biggest search in its history. The search and rescue project manager said, today she is our sister, our daughter, and that became the mantra. We don't live in a society where we tolerate a 20-year-old woman being abducted in the night. It wouldn't be long before the police found what they were looking for. A Coast Guard helicopter noticed something floating in the water near a local lighthouse, and it was a body. They had found Berna. When this news came out, Iceland went into mourning, and people were shocked and couldn't believe what they were hearing. Things like this only happened in movies and other places. In Iceland, they didn't happen. People in Greenland were shocked and saddened along with their Nordic neighbors. The main street in Reykjavik, where Berna had gone, was turned into a shrine with candles lit up. The funeral for Berna took place at the Hallegrim Skirkia, which is the country's largest church. Over 2,000 people, including the president and prime minister, were there. People needed answers from the police, and they had to give them. First, they had to figure out what killed the person. Berna had been found naked, but they could find no evidence of a sexual assault. The examiner found that she had suffered blunt force trauma to the head and had been strangled as well. However, the official cause of death was ruled as drowning. She had survived the initial attack and was alive when she was put into the water. Even though Grimson and his team looked at all the evidence, they couldn't find any link between Nikolai's death and the murder of Berna. They didn't think he had anything to do with it. He was freed after two weeks in jail and hours of questioning. They looked back at Thomas again. His story hadn't changed, and he wasn't going to change it either. During nine interviews with the police, he insisted that he was not guilty. As more evidence came in, the police still couldn't figure out why Thomas would kill Berna, even though they had a crime scene and a suspect. His DNA was found on a lace of Berna's Doc Martens, and his fingerprints were on her old driver's license from March 30th 2017. Breaking news alerts were spreading all over Iceland. The police had charged Thomas Miller Olsen with drug possession and murder. Media interest in the story reached a fever pitch as his trial began in August of that year. It was during his trial that he sensationally changed his story. He said that there were not two girls, only one, Berna. He claimed that he had left the car to go to the bathroom and Nikolai had driven off with Berna in the back seat. When he returned, she wasn't with him, shocking the court. He was now trying to pin the murder on his crewmate, admitting to the drug possession, but denying murder. At the end of September, the three judges found him guilty on all charges. He was then taken to start his 19-year prison sentence. When Thomas Miller Olson tried to appeal his conviction, the High Court upheld it. The next year, the High Court refused to look at another appeal. There was a lot of shock in Iceland when Berna Brian's daughter was killed. This case will be remembered. It changed us a bit. Our feeling of safety, the chaplain who led Berna's funeral said. More CCTV was put up around Reykjavik and women became more cautious around strangers. Even though Grimson had been a police officer for 30 years, this was his first murder case. People in Iceland saw him as a hero because he was calm and coordinated. He is now proud to work for his country at the European Union's agency in The Hague for law enforcement cooperation. Even though Birna Brian's daughter's murder was a terrible event, her memory is still alive and the people of Iceland are determined that she will never be forgotten. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
In the mid-1920s, the story of Dina Thompson, a British woman who was known as the Black Widow, was the subject of many crime shows and documentaries. At first glance, this woman seemed nice, but she turned out to be a pathological liar and con artist who killed at least one man who loved her deeply. Dina got away with many crimes, but in 2003, she was finally put in jail. Even though the person was facing life in prison, the court was surprisingly lenient and let them out on parole. So in 2022, one of the most dangerous criminals got away with her crimes after miraculously surviving her evil ex-husband. Experts say that the fact that Thompson's victims were always men may be a sign that the criminal experienced some kind of trauma as a child or teen. Dina, on the other hand, had a very good childhood. The girl was born in North London in 1960 and grew up with her whole family. Their family didn't have much, but they made sure their daughter had everything she needed. Their head of the family worked as a prison guard and was very into sports. Dina's father encouraged her to go to gyms as a child, where she worked hard at gymnastics. In addition, the man often took his daughter with him to all kinds of sports competitions, even ones that were held in other countries. As a child, Dina was active, happy, and friendly. She quickly became friends with her peers and, as she got older, learned how to get guys' attention quickly. The girl went to college after high school and then got a job at a bank in the area. When Dina was 22, she met Lee Wyatt, who would become her first husband. Someone set them up on a blind date, which is how they met in the first place. As soon as the two young people met, they fell in love and a rough romance began. They got along great and spent a lot of time together. After two years, they made their relationship official. After getting married, the couple moved to Yapton, a small town in the country with only 3,000 people. Soon after, they had a son, and the new parents slowly started their own business by making one-of-a-kind soft toys based on pictures they came up with together. At the same time, Dina worked as a cashier for a construction company. Neighbors said that their family was very happy and doing well. The family head was often away on business trips and wasn't at home for long periods of time. When it came to his neighbors, the man hardly ever talked to them, but his wife quickly became friendly with people in the area. Dina knew how to get along with others, and men were quick to trust her. The pretty young woman often caught their attention. Dina met a young reporter named Julian Webb at the start of the 1990s. The man offered to use her as a model for ads for clothes and home goods, and sooner pictures were in newspapers and magazines in the area. Dina was happy to pose for the picture and didn't mind being looked at. Lee Wyatt hadn't been home in months, and no one was sure where he was or what was wrong with him. It turned out that Lee had been in the small town of New Quay the whole time, which is almost on the other side of the country. His plan was to hide from the mafia, so he lived there under a fake name and fake papers. The man's wife told him a series of clever lies to make him believe that their family was in grave danger and that the only way out was to run away. In addition to making unique soft toys, the couple was also known for making a leprechaun named Sean, which sold well and became somewhat famous. Around the beginning of 1991, Dina told her husband that the Disney company liked their creation so much that they were willing to pay 50 million pounds to use the character. But the happiness didn't last long. Soon, the woman told them that criminals had learned about the big deal and wanted to take most of the money while threatening to kill the whole family. Dina also found a way out. She cleverly told her husband he needed to secrete himself. Lee got some fake papers right away and ran away. The woman, however, was very smart and got Lee to write her several threatening letters and record several similar phone calls. She said that this would show that he hated his wife and stopped the mafia from after her. The husband did what his wife told him to do because he didn't think anything was wrong. He then ran away. Lee was willing to do any job because he was in a new city and didn't have a home or any friends. He sent all the money he made to his wife and son so they didn't have to worry about anything. Most likely this escape really did save his life, but not from imaginary thieves. His own wife was the real threat. Dina married her new love, Julian, in November of the same year, 1991. The wedding was paid for with the money Lee had sent home, even though Dina had lied to him about it. Webb was deeply in love and very happy, but soon after the wedding, 
Neighbors noticed that the woman often went to see her lovers while her husband was at work. After some time, she told Julian that she was dying and that her job had fired her because of it. The story about the fatal diagnosis and being fired was a lie from the beginning to the end. It also turned out that a lot of money had been taken from the company where Dana worked, and she was the main suspect in the crime. After that, the woman said that her first husband, Lee Wyatt, threatened her and made her do the crime. She showed proof in the form of the letters and recordings that she had herself persuaded him to make. Wyatt went back home as soon as he found out that his wife had married someone else. A scandal was all that the case was about, and Dana said he beat her, but there was no proof of this. The detective still chose to side with the woman, though, so Lee had to quickly leave Yapton again. When Julian was in love, his situation didn't bother him at all, and he spent all of his savings on her fake illness so she could get better. While the money was still there, time went on and Julian began to wonder how the treatment was going. It turned out that the woman didn't have any medical records to back up her diagnosis. Family relationships broke down, and neighbors heard the spouses yelling at each other. Julian's sudden death happened in June 1994, just one day after his 31st birthday party. His mom called him the night before the terrible event, but Dina said her husband wasn't feeling well and couldn't answer. Julian's mom told her sister-in-law to call an ambulance, but her sister-in-law didn't listen. The experts found that the young man died of a drug overdose, but no one thought that this was a criminal act, and the man's wife insisted that her husband had chosen to end his own life. She also wanted Julian's body to be burned, but his parents were very against this. After she died, Dina tried to get a big insurance payment from her husband, but she was turned down because their marriage was ruled invalid. Dina didn't even try to cry or show sadness at the funeral. Instead, she wore an honest outfit and acted rudely. Almost right away after that, the widowed woman started having a lot of affairs and romances. She didn't hide the fact that she had lovers over. She did it in public. Dina filed for divorce from her first legal husband in 1997. A little less than a year later, she met Richard Thompson and fell in love with him right away. Dana didn't give it much thought before telling her new lover that she was very sick and didn't have long to live. The man, who was deeply in love with her, promised to make the last few months of her life into a fairy tale. He was ready to spend all of his savings on this. The wedding took place in one of Florida's best hotels, and the couple spent their honeymoon there before moving to Brighton, England on the south coast of their home country. Richard said that the way his wife cared for and supported him literally put a spell on him. She also skillfully pretended to agree with all of his ideas and goals. He had always wanted to own his own boat so that he could fish professionally. His wife not only liked the idea, but she also suggested that he start a business renting out yachts so that he could fish and teach other people how to fish. A romantic dinner was planned for Dina and her husband on New Year's Eve less than a year after they got married. After taking a bath together, she told her husband she had made him a special gift and asked for permission to tie him up. Richard agreed right away because he didn't think anything was wrong. He had ropes around his hands, a blindfold over his eyes, and a gag in his mouth when he was hit hard on the head with a bat. This was followed by another hit. Thanks to his quick thinking, Richard not only didn't pass out but also got away quickly. After that, Dina got a knife and cut her husband in the shoulder. Richard took the gun away from his wife, held her down, and called the police. She broke down in tears and told him she had been lying to him the whole time and spent all of his money. Once she got to the police station, though, she calmed down and started to say that her husband had attacked her and that she was only protecting herself. The story didn't end there. The next day, a real estate agent came to Richard's house to try to sell it. The landlady told him that her husband had left for America on a business trip before their meeting. Richard knew at that moment that his wife was planning to kill him, sell the house, and take the money. Because everyone thought Thompson had crossed the ocean, no one would look for him. It turned out that the woman had taken all of her husband's money out of his bank accounts and used his credit cards to rack up a lot of debt while the case was going on in court. A lot of people heard about the case and other men who used to be with Dina 
and were cheated on and drained of money by her lies about a fake disease that could not be cured, started to call the police. The woman's first husband then talked about how he had to hide for many years, first from people who thought the mafia was after her, and then from the police. It turned out that Dana had stolen from the company where she worked, even though she blamed her husband for everything. Even though there was strong evidence against the woman, she was found not guilty of attacking her husband Richard Thompson. Some people said that Richard made up the story to get attention for himself. Dina was still found guilty of many financial frauds and given a sentence of almost four years in prison. All the attention on Dina Thompson also made people think of her second husband, journalist Julian Webb, who died in a strange and sudden way. The woman herself gave very different stories about how and why he died. She said that the steroids her husband took to stay in shape were killing him. Then she said he drank a lot and then passed out in the sun, getting sunstroke. She even said that he killed himself at the inquest even though she had warned them not to. Dana told her best friend that she had poisoned her husband by putting strong drugs in a dish that he loved that was spicy. The police were able to find the owner of the diner where Julian often ate and picked up food to go. He remembered that Webb's wife had made rice and chicken curry the day before the terrible event. Then, the police thought that this seasoning might have been hiding the real taste of the drugs. Because new information came to light, a new investigation was started, and Julian's body was dug up and sent to be looked at. It turned out that the man was poisoned by a lot of strong antidepressants that were mixed into his favorite curry dish, and then made stronger by aspirin, which Dina mixed into her husband's drink. Webb was still alive when his mother called. He could have been saved, but that wasn't a plan from his wife. For the first time, the Black Widow was put on trial in 2003. During the hearing, the investigator said she was the most dangerous woman he had ever worked with, and the judge said she was a very good liar. Dina Thompson was given a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 16 years. People have made documentaries about the crimes of the Black Widow, talked about them on TV, and written about them in the news. Detectives found out about another scary event in Dina's past even after she was in jail. The person who was one of her first lovers never showed up again and has still not been found, dead or alive. Stanislav Kostov was the young man's name. He lived in Bulgaria, which is where Dana trained as a gymnast in the late 1970s. A romantic relationship started between them, and then the guy was never seen again. The investigation doesn't rule out the possibility that Dana has something to do with this case, and Kostov was one of her first victims. But there was nothing that could be shown. Thompson worked with a prison psychologist and took rehabilitation classes while she was in jail. The detective in charge of Dina's case says that she doesn't feel bad about what she did and can commit another crime even though she has been good and said the right things about re-education and admitting her mistakes. Still, Black Widow, who was 61 years old, was let out of prison in the summer of 2022. Richard Thompson said he wouldn't feel safe now that he knows about it because he doesn't know what to expect from his ex-spouse. Now Dina has to tell the police about all of her relationships and connections, stay inside after dark, and report all of her financial transactions. She also can't talk to her ex-husbands or lovers who were hurt by what she did. She has to wear a special bracelet on her leg that keeps track of everything she does. A few months after she was freed, reporters caught Thompson coming back from the store with a big bag of shopping. On her right hand's ring finger, there was a huge ring that looked a lot like an engagement ring. It is possible that the Black Widow caught another gullible person in her web. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Wedding travel, also known as a honeymoon, is a significant event in the lives of young families. It can leave vivid memories of an unforgettable adventure or, for example, provide a long-awaited escape from the mundane life somewhere on the azure coast, under the shade of palm trees. But what if you go on a wedding trip and end up committing or being accused of a crime? Would the honeymoon be as bright and carefree in that case? I don't think so. Unforgettable, of course. Hellman, whose real name is Isabella Rodriguez, was born in 1975 in Colombia 
a country where everyone speaks Spanish. But Isabella really dreamed of the American dream. She read English books and listened to English songs on the radio to learn the language as quickly as possible so she could go to the north of Europe. Even though she was able to learn the language, she would always have a southern accent. This didn't stop the young woman from moving to Florida, where she worked as a real estate agent for people who only spoke Spanish. Isabella married William Hellman in 2002, even though her previous relationships didn't work out. They were married for 10 years, but their whole relationship was marked by constant fights and problems at home. Finally, when neither partner could take it any longer, they filed for divorce. The process took a very long two years. Isabella even found a new man during this time, and she hoped to be happy with him. Lewis Bennett was the name of the new lover. He was born in Great Britain but moved to Australia as a child and had dual citizenship. He went back to his home country to finish his education at the prestigious Camborne School of Mines. Lewis, on the other hand, never got a job in his field. He eventually went back to Australia and started his own business making solar panels. After four years, he went into the American market. His main office was in Florida, so the young and promising Lewis started using the internet to look for a wife there. Lewis tried to meet someone online for a long time, but had no luck. He looked at the profiles of women, but didn't pay much attention to them. The women who wrote to him first either turned him off or didn't interest him. But when he saw Isabella's picture, he thought she looked a lot like Jennifer Lopez, so he wrote to her. They wrote to each other for a long time, and Isabella talked about her hopes to move to the United States from Colombia, how hard it was for her to learn English, and her job search. She eventually told him about the men she dated in the past. Bennett didn't care at all about her past, because she knew Isabella and William were going to get a divorce soon. In order to meet Lewis in person, Isabella made plans to go to wherever he was, whether it was England, Australia, or even Thailand. Lewis bought a catamaran to show his new girlfriend Isabella how much he liked her. He planned to take her on a trip around the Caribbean Sea. He dreamed of doing this since he moved around a lot as a child and found it hard to make lasting friends. In his spare time, he read adventure books by authors like Jules Verne and Robert Louis Stevenson. Treaser Iceland was his favorite book and it would become an important part of his life. When Isabella had free time, like on vacation or over the weekend, she always went on trips with Lewis. She saw that Lewis almost forgot about work while on these expensive trips, though it could be said that his company's processes were highly automated, which gave him time to relax. When Isabella tried to talk to Lewis about his work-life balance, he either laughed it off or said that he had a big inheritance and didn't need to worry about anything. Isabella was happy with his answer. The couple celebrated the birth of their daughter Amelia in July 2016. It was a big deal for both of them, and that's when the fight started. Isabella had a hard time deciding how to raise their daughter, or even which country would be best for her upbringing, because of things that had happened to her in the past. Lewis wanted Amelia to grow up in Australia with his parents, but Isabella wanted to stay in the United States. As a compromise, they finally moved to Florida. In 2017, even though they already had a child together, they decided to get married. Isabella asked her husband to take her on a honeymoon on his catamaran because she thought that being on the water would bring them back together. Lewis agreed, but the date was pushed back. They finally left on their romantic cruise at the end of April 2017. At first, their social media posts made it look like everything was going as planned for Isabella. Photos of them smiling and having a great time sailing around the Caribbean islands gave her hope. However, after the first photos from the honeymoon, there was silence for two weeks. When Isabella went online again, she told her family that they were in Cuba and were planning to go back to Florida, but they didn't know the exact plans yet. She also said that their internet connection was slow which meant that they might not be reachable for a few days. In the middle of the night on May 15th, Lewis called the Coast Guard to say he was lost and alone on a raft out at sea. Right away, the rescuers started looking for Lewis. They found him near the Bahamas on a raft that was full of food and other supplies. 
Lewis told a story about how he had asked Isabella to rest for a few hours after a long day and then given her control of the catamaran. A heavy thump from below woke him up after he went to take a nap in the cabin. He thought Isabella had been thrown overboard when he couldn't find her and saw that the catamaran was taking on water. He got his things together and moved to the rescue boat, thinking that her life vest would keep her safe. It was strange that he didn't use a beacon or a satellite phone to call for help. The Coast Guard didn't understand what was going on. They looked around and saw that there were no underwater rocks or reefs that could have sunk the boat like Lewis said. The boat also had open escape hatches, which is against safety rules, and suggests that someone was trying to sink the ship on purpose. It was proven by divers that the holes in the catamaran's bottom were made from the inside. The condition of the boat did not match Lewis's account of hitting rocks in the water. Another strange thing about the case was that Lewis only put his things on the life raft as if he didn't think he would find Isabella alive. He even brought silver coins that are hard to find that are hidden in aluminum tubes. Later, investigations showed that one of Lewis's friends had stolen these coins in 2016. Lewis was charged with smuggling because of how he behaved. The fact that there were open escape hatches and other suspicious circumstances. While the person was being held for smuggling, the investigation went on and more evidence came to light. In the house where Isabella and Lewis had lived, recording devices were found that had recordings of Lewis making death threats against Isabella. Isabella told her friends about these threats and how she wanted to leave her husband, but she also wanted to give their marriage one more chance. Debts, real estate, electricity, and credit cards were the main things that made them fight. Lewis had a lot of debt but didn't. He declined to deal with his money problems and instead chose to travel instead of working. Even told Isabella she had to get a job to help him pay off his debts while he kept traveling. The investigation also found that between 2014 and 2016, Lewis sent money to other countries worth a total of $160,000. These transfers had something to do with the stolen collectible coins that Lewis had on him. Lewis was facing more charges of involuntary manslaughter as the evidence grew. Lewis Bennett took a plea deal in November 2018 and pleaded guilty to both smuggling drugs and manslaughter by accident. He went to prison for eight years and couldn't get any of Isabella's insurance payments or property. The court told Lewis that he had to give his daughter Amelia money because she would have to deal with the emotional pain of losing her mother as she grew up. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.